it. This is the TC workshop. Uh, I'm Jamal. The agenda. Do I just? Oh, yeah. There's the agenda. So I'm gonna. I'm working on some TC documentation. I just got frustrated over all the internet fake news about how TC works sometimes. So I'm, I'm writing a document. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to talk about that for five minutes. Then there's some uh, motivation from the P4 TC workshop we, we did. What uh, kind of joint with Mali uh, on how P4 requests for arbitrary metadata? Mali is going to go on and on. by the uh, TC P4 workshop. Antonin is going to follow. <laughs> See, there's uh, first section. I, it introduces a bunch of uh, abstractions to explain some of the concepts. Uh, then it talks about TC overview. We'll talk about queuing disciplines. Go into complex egress topologies. Classify action blocks. Describe how hardware offloading works. And eventually, we'll talk about. There'll be a section which talks about how you, how you write a new key disk, how you write a new action, how you write a new classifier. Uh, so it goes all the way from the manager who just wants to talk very high level about what TC is, to which is just uh, talks about TC as a network infrastructure service, to the guy who wants to code or girl that wants to code. So there's a lot of stuff here. I only have five minutes because I just wanted to say that this is going to exist now. So you see all the nice diagrams. Uh, so I'm just going to jump through it quickly. There's even a BNF grammar. I think this is correct. Uh, of how the PC utility works and the graphs when you build the actions and the classifiers. Uh, there's, uh, so there's such several chapters I have about 30 pages so far. And so far I'm going top down. I'm going from if you're a manager, just read the first section and stop. You, you may, it may make sense for you in a meeting. And, and uh, I describe some of the concepts in a little bit more detail. Uh, every TC object has an identity that, and a coordinate in a graph and details of that sort. Okay, so any questions on this? Uh, I won't spend much time on it here.
Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to post it. So the question is, where is it? Use the mic if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, if there's two mics because it's being recorded. That way, my, my mom knows I was here and then I'm, I'm, I'm famous. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, we, I don't know where to post it. I'm looking for a location to put it, but uh, it's using something called Gitbook. So you have uh, MD format, you can edit and add sections to it, or send me patches and I'll fix them. Right. And if you're here, you can, I'll give you a copy if you, uh, you're interested in the current version. Just email me or just find me in the hallway somewhere. All right, we go to the next uh, section. The next slide set. Uh, yeah, the arbitrary metadata. Next slide, please. Yeah, arbitrary metadata. No, not that. Yeah, that one, but in proper format, that looks messed up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So this effort comes out of, uh, we had a workshop back in uh, June, I think, on how to integrate, it's a whole day workshop on P4 and TC. Uh, and one of the things that was very obvious is P4 uh, requires that you're able to define arbitrary metadata, and Linux doesn't have a concept of where I, if I define metadata, I have to go and edit an SKB and put some flag or, and the idea is I'll have a, a, a user space construct which P4, so P4 allows us to define arbitrary metadata that doesn't exist in the kernel. The question is how we, we can't extend the uh, SKB anymore. And there's no space. And the SKB really is a global static metadata. Like an SKB mark is set by something on ingress, consumed by something on ingress. And in the case of P4, it's a classifier could create some metadata which is consumed by an action uh, three doors down, or three, uh, three actions later con consumes this, or an action could consume it resubmit the packet to the classifier, which then uses it to classify further. So, so that, that's the motivation for this. Um, and of course, you, uh, you get shot, you will get uh, prosecuted if you add any more fields to the SKB. Uh, and it turns out that if we're going to do P4 TC, then the scope is only for the TC pipeline between classifiers and actions as in here. So. That's the point. Yeah. So if you look, if you look at this, this is the classifier loop. If you want to call it, calls filters in each chain. There's a chain, one chain, another one. So we loop until we find a match. Uh, in, in case of a chain, and we call. There's another loop for each action, which calls a bunch of actions. That's that's the way TC works, right? So. Consider this a loop and consider each of these a loop. And the lifetime of the metadata is just between, within these constructs here. And so, uh, so I picked this TC SKB uh, field called um, uh, CB. There's a field, if people should be familiar with this, if you're uh, working on drivers or on other subsystems. So it's called the CB structure, which is a pointer of, uh, it's 48 bytes that sits in the SKB allocated for uh, uh, scratch pad, essentially. So you, it's, uh, you can, each subsystem that use, can use it to store temporary state, it's not guaranteed to survive in the next function calls, and uh, it's, anybody can trample on it. But given that, in our case, the lifetime of the guaranteed lifetime is here. Then, and I checked all the code. 
There's no consumer of this, uh, except for the first few fields here. And to be fair to the guys who are just standing here, is there like a headset I can wear? There. Ah. This. So, I mean, there. So that, that, those first few fields are used by, I've seen TCP set them, I think, and consumed by the QDesk. But, so we're reserving the bold version here. That field, the 20 bytes, is more than enough to store a lot of this metadata that we have. Um, and I borrowed heavily from, so you need some methods or help us to set and get this metadata. Uh, the IFE action has a lot of helper functions that uh, was setting and encoding, encoding and decoding metadata on the wire. So they, they, we can reuse some of that stuff or write brand new action, uh, uh, functions. Uh, so the first one is I want to get if the consumer of the metadata will specify a metadata ID, provide the SKB and get retained avoid pointer to their data. And the producer will just call the SKB meta set, passes the SKB, what the method ID value, the length, the void, uh, pointer to data. I'm assuming in this case there's just, you know, the, these values are very small, like, you know, you have 32 bits, 16 bits. Looking at P4 uh, sample code that I've seen so far, it sounds sufficient to have something up maybe to use 64 bit. Uh, is that true? Yeah, but what kind of, how big could the metadata be? How big could the metadata be in typical scenarios? Single metadata. 64 bits. So we have 20 bytes, so we can probably fit a couple of them, maybe what, that's eight bytes, two 64 bits and 132 bit. My math right, yeah. Uh, so, and maybe a few smaller ones. So this looks safe to me that we can pass it between back and forth. Uh, it was identified as a gap in our meeting. Um, I haven't pushed any code yet, but I'm working on it. And since you hear about it here, if you have any comments or uh, issues you see with this. Mike, uh, where's the mic? There's a, there's a mic? Okay, there's one there. There's yeah. another mic. Also, just one thought about this. Uh, one thing you might look at doing, uh, instead of using this like 20 bytes, um, you might look at almost like a metadata chaining type setup, where essentially you can take the size of SKB CB, subtract that first struct, and that's what's left over for your metadata struct, um, which could then be a separate thing. It's just so you have a way of tracking it instead of having it just be an arbitrary array in the structure. Have something else that your function defines. You could have a header file that says, okay, this is how much data you have left over. If you go across this with your metadata, we should throw a build warning, you know, in your uh, header file, something like that. Where do we put that? Like, uh, there's no space in the SKB. Do you look at it as a global? Well, so you're having to implement this SKB meta get and SKB meta set. So essentially, what you'd end up having to do is if the length plus, I don't know if there's an offset or wherever. Sorry, let me, let me go back to that uh, SKB. Struct. Yeah, there. Sorry. Yeah, it is. Right. So, um, you, if you were to take the size of the QDisk SKB CB, mm -hmm. subtract that from the known size of the SKB CB region, that tells you the size that you have left. And so, it's, you just have to have something where, like, basically, yeah. it would be something that if you're doing a custom P4 thing, you might want to have extra code in there somewhere saying, okay, if my metadata is larger than that, I should throw a build warning because I won't work on this kernel. Okay, point taken. Uh, so we'll define just what that data is in a different structure. Right, and that, right. And that also would free up more room, because right now you actually have, was it, you only using eight bytes there, so I think you have like 40 bytes left, and it's 48 bytes for SKBC. Yeah, the, the problem when I looked at the code is somebody's actually marking around with, across subsystems, I think TCP sets it, I don't know if this, I have to go and look again. So I didn't want to touch this first few fields. All right, the first few fields have to stay, but right. nothing says that you have to arbitrarily, I don't think there's anything that says you have to arbitrarily, arbitrarily limit it to 20 bytes. 
Because when I first looked at it, I'm like, why would it be 20? Why not 24? Just, you know, keep yourself aligned to an 8 by long. Um, oh, yeah. And it occurred to me that now you can just go ahead and fill in all the extra space that's left over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Patches are not out yet, so don't, don't harass me on the, on the mailing list. Once I send them, that's it. <laughs> oh. Okay. So th this was a gap that was found right when we were having the discussion in the meeting there. Uh, the next one, I guess, this is a good segue to Marty. There's another gap that can you put up Marty's slides next. Okay, so um, actually, uh, since I don't think I don't think that every one in this room was in the um, P4 workshop related to uh, on the PC workshop related to P4, I I will start with the motivation. What we are trying to do in general, uh, together with Jamal. Uh, so what we are trying to do is actually um, um, create. Uh, a mode which is which we call an hybrid mode, saying that we want to use all the legacy Linux infrastructure to do routing, bridging, etc., and in the same time being able to um, customize part of it. Um, and this is like so. If you look at the slide, we have the old world, which everything is well defined uh, in the code. All the functionality is well defined. There is some kind of new road which ever since programmable, and there is something in the middle saying I want to use uh, 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 some pieces from. I don't want to replace my IP router. I don't want to replace my bridge, but I do want to create some new technology, uh, maybe uh, a new overlay technology, uh, which is different than the uh, um, the current one. Maybe I want to add uh, inbound telemetry to the packet somewhere. And I want to customize that, um, or to introduce a new functionality which is not which is, which does not exist. Um, how can I change slide? Okay, so in our level, this is what we're trying to do. Yeah, um, we are trying to come up with uh, something called the Linux target architecture. Uh, and the idea behind that, that this target architecture uh, will be generic to multiple hardware. It won't be uh, a specific hardware. Um, it will use TCS as, as a backend. And it will uh, be able to use all the... Um, Linux forwarding entity, in addition to that, to add uh, some customized uh, part. Here they are in blue, the old Flex 1, Flex 2, Flex 3. Again, this is an example. It's not all the flexible point that you can use. It, it, it is just an example to, to, to illustrate the concept. Um, so looking at TC, it looks quite capable. You can define a pipeline in all those points, like uh, bind it to an device, create a chain of tables, uh, create quite flexible match and action. We can always add additional uh, 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 flexibility there. Uh, and metadata is major uh, part, as Jamal described, because it gives you the ability to define your own data and, and traverse uh, information between different tables. It's quite powerful. Um, but there is an additional missing part, which is uh, the parsing and the deparsing. So. I want to focus, in the, uh, focus on the parsing part. And again, this is work in progress. Uh, we are working on that now. Um, it is not, it's just an ID. It is not something that works or we uh, didn't write code, but 
I want to share our plan and to get the feedback. Um, so the motivation is to customize, to, to modify the parser. And when you are modifying the parser, is not only it is not only the ability to extract a uh, field because then you can use utility tool, which is quite quite flexible and quite capable, and you can extract field offsets whatever from the packet. It is more than that. You need actually to uh, uh, um, you want the ability to take a packet with a format with I don't know inbuilt telemetry somewhere in the packet. Let's say after the layer two and still make the uh, uh, Linux infrastructure uh, um, to be able to parse the IP header now. Um, so this is in general how a flexible parser look like. Uh, you have some basic graph which describe all the nodes, nodes are headers, and an and arch are the, uh, uh, um, the movement between different headers. Um, and um, in modern hardware, you have ability to uh, mo modify the stuff and, and program it. And introduce a new header, whether those new headers are after layer 2, after layer 3, replacing layer 3, whatever. Um, and the question is, how can we do it and introduce that into the Linux uh, infrastructure? And what I would like to talk about is the flow day sector, which actually um, extract. Uh, it is the infrastructure to extract in the Linux. Uh, uh, and parse all the header, and currently it is fixed. So it's all the header network can uh, uh, um, LT, sorry, L3 and L4 are well defined there. You can see it is outcoded, and then uh, the format is outcoded. And once you get a field that you're familiar with, you know what's to extract it. But then if you introduce a new field, your, your, uh, the flow the sector won't be able to extract the IP. Even if there is an IP there, and all, all you added is a, a new MPLS or a new inbound telemetry or whatever. Um, and this is what we propose, or we think maybe a, a, a can be a solution to that. Um, the follow the sector is uh, looking at the packets, extracting the prototype, and then according to the type, uh, it can. Uh, oh, actually, it is animation, and this is a PDF probably. <laughs> we won't see the animation. That's not okay. Sorry for that. So I will try to illustrate that. So uh, in each decision point, what uh, we can do is uh, we are looking at the protocol. Uh, we can uh, say, okay, stop. We can say, go back to the protocol. For example, if you have a multiple VLAN header, you want to iterate and extract all the VLAN header. And you can go uh, to the next level, which will be IP protocol for the layer 3. And the, for the IP protocol, you can do the same. You can uh, decide to rotate back to the proto for encapsulation, for example. Uh, and you can uh, um, rotate in the IP protocol itself. IPv6 uh, option are using that. You are going to extract all the options that way. And you can go out in case um, you pass IP4, you want to move to, um, um, to the um, and what we, do, we would like to add, we would like to add a programmable part in which we can actually add a new TCP option or add a new uh, proto, like VPLS, new VPLS or new inbound telemetry or whatever. And for that, um, what we thought is that we can add a eBPF hook point on the proto part and eBPF hook point on the IP proto part. And by doing that, we can actually uh, be able to jump on uh, the new headers and um, jump, whether jump is going back to the portal and they just digest, digest the new headers or going to the IP portal, going in a loop if you have a new tunnel as, and, uh, and so on. So this is the high level idea. Um, sorry for the animation. It was more impressive in my laptop, but never mind. Um, and this is what I have. Any questions, stuff? Uh, can you turn this on? Okay, you got it on. Uh, yeah, Tom. He's touching the delay sector. Is the second microphone? Yeah. Where's the second microphone? Oh, it's on the stand. Okay, okay, we'll try that one. Can you
Okay, so um, let me see if I understand this. So we want to have BPF somewhere in here to do protocol parsing. Right. Um, I think at one point somebody had done a flow detector in BPF, and it was like a 10% performance cost. I'm not sure um, that was ever integrated into flow dissect. So I, I think it's relatively, should be relatively straightforward, and I think it's a great idea. Uh, flow flow dissect function is just crazy long. That's, yeah, there's a long history there. Um, anything we can do to clean it up, especially if we can move out some of the less, um, uh, less uh, common protocols out of that function. So we keep adding more and more protocols like that. I guess my question, though, is since we already have the structure that does multi-layer parsing, like first we do the protocol parsing, and then we do transport protocol, and then might loop back, would you envision that um, the BPF is just individual hook points, like, like, oh, this is to actually parse a transport protocol, this is to parse a networking protocol, or would there just be one BPF program that if you don't go – you don't find what you're looking for in the, the normal kernel code, maybe you hop into BPF. So I, my first thought was the first option, just adding, being able to add an eBPF program for each one of those blocks. Not replacing all of it, but just customizing the, uh, or introducing the other that you want to add. But I think that, again, probably we will implement that and we will see. Maybe we'll need more flexibility or to replace more. To yeah, be able to customize both. So, so we have two switch statements, and you know, these are the right. two main switch statements. So you can have a default case in both of those. But then it might also be interesting, what if you want to override uh, the processing for, like, IP, proto, TCP? What if, so you may – then you have to have more or separate. So I think the implementation is going to be interesting um, because this protocol – or this function is already so complex and we're trying to – Reduce the complexity, but that may entail actually populating a lot of uh, hooks into various points. So it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Look forward to it. Cool. Any more questions? Yes. Um, you talk about EBPF, yep. but at the end you have probably want to take it to the hardware. Mm -hmm. So. Do you think that CBBF is the right solution, or maybe it's something that's more generic and right? Right. What do you mean by right? This is one of the options. So yeah. this is not the only option. So EBPF is one way to expose vulnerability. Probably they may be another option. I'm now talking about you know looking at that in my personal need, saying okay, uh, I think this is a good solution in order to express uh, um, a new person, and this is something we can offer. But I guess that there will be other uh, proposals as well, and other methods as well, and all are welcome. It's not like the only solution. Because in the beginning, the customer had probably some concept, like a P4 concept, a flex parser. No, no, the, 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 okay, sorry. And, and I didn't mention that. it to, to EBPF, and then you want to take it from EBPF back yeah, to yeah. hardware that's not supporting EBPF. So, again, so, so EBPF, no, so, so EBPF gives you the ability to do everything. Everything like very like flexible. I'm not talking about being, being able to offload EBPF. I'm, to, I'm talking about being able to offload EBPF parsing uh, definition, puzzle definition. But this is something we can offer. And again, the, the idea is that the user will write a P4. It will be compiled into PC and EBPF, and we will be able to offload the, the match action from the TC to the hardware and the parser part from the EBPF to the hardware. So, yeah, so essentially the EBPF becomes a fallback for the hardware offload. So it comes down to Yeah. Or if you have and a software yeah. only. Right. So, uh, how do you offload it? So you have a scheme where you could take the BPF uh, program and transform it into parser in, the kernel, in your chip? Yeah. Yes, this is okay. the intention. No, you can really take the original code, the P4 code and take it to the chip. I no, see. You don't want to take it to compile it to the BPF and then try to... I see. No, just a minute. We don't have a... The, we don't, this is a channel that we don't have. We do not have a channel that will transfer the P4 original program to the uh, kernel. 
right? Okay. I'm not talking about so introducing a new user space channel in order to give me the before. I'm talking about taking the EBPF bytecode and offload that. Offload into your ASIC? Yeah. Again, as long as we are talking about very specific okay. EBPF program. Uh, it sounds a little crazy, but it's, so it's not generic. No, no. I, I didn't, and again, I didn't say we are going to open uh, I'm kind of agreeing with Ronnie, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to propose the opposite in my slides, which is like you take the P4, you generate some firmware for your ASIC, for example, and you generate some EPBF bytecode, which is going to be the software fallback. But the control pass always goes through the kernel and EPBF map, so only that part is uploaded, the, the control pass. I don't have a problem with that. This is a different concept. So now you are saying that you have two paths. One you are going to configure, in one in which you are going to configure the hardware, and the other one will be the kernel. So this, is, yeah. So this is a little bit different than uh, the offload uh, mechanism, which you are offloading something that the, that the kernel has. Now you need to under, uh, explain how you make sure that there is a consistency between them, and they behave the same and. So why is different than other SDK? Uh, yeah. So to use Alex's terminology, it's when you when you it's a back uh, it's, it's a backup to the hardware. It's, it's not really a hardware translation, but rather if you have to do it in software, this is how you would do it. Then yeah, BPF may make sense there. Uh, so so I will point out some hardware does support BPF also. <laughs> uh, so like Metronome, this yeah. this you would just take the same exact program push it down to hardware. So it's not like it's either or. They're actually, um, they, they may just be different, but the, I think the fact is right now BPS is embedded in Linux kernel and P4 isn't. So it's kind of a, a no-brainer from that point of view to go with BPS for this. Um, the, the, this so for Netronome it makes sense, right? I mean, you take the same blob and push it into the hardware and it works. For you as, or other people. Uh, again, again, I'm, I'm not talking about EPPF in general. Right. I'm talking about very specific and small programs. Yes, one piece of it. Yeah, a small piece of it that uh, only uh, uh, extract know how to define a parser. And for that, that we can offload. We won't be able to offload EPPF in general. We will be able to offload that. So I think this is a good segue into Antonin's uh, talk. Maybe he says he has a different approach. And uh, the whole point here is to have a consensus so we can work together as opposed to each one has their own island somewhere. Uh, one question. Oh, wait, there's some more questions. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm concerned about the actual uh, packet path. If, if the packet's already gone into the kernel and we've started processing it essentially in software, now you have to have a hopefully retain a copy of the packet that you can match up in the hardware and you can um, also um, asynchronously request this offload action and then um, asynchronously get that result back. Isn't there going to be a more cost for, for that processing? And how do you, when you've got lots of packets coming through and lots of essentially contacts, and that's a, a lot of chatty conversation going across the PCI interface. Um, okay, so just, um, I didn't start with that. I'm from Menlock Switch, and this is something we are doing in the switch. So in the switch, we don't have, so when, when you're talking about software folding in the switch, it is mainly for exceptions, like ARP miss, TTL violation, MTU violation, and so on. We are not folding, really folding traffic in in software. It does not work when you have 6.4 terabit device, right? You cannot really do a slow buff. Uh, I'm from the same background as Maddie, so I kind of agree with that. Maybe it's a simplistic view, but for me, either you can do the whole packet processing in hardware, or you have a punting to CPU pass for extensions through the PCIe, and then because you have your software fallback, you can uh, do the entire processing in software, or go to uh, user space application. <laughs> Uh, anybody remote that has a question? Uh, I don't know if they can hear me. Hello? All right, just say something on the chat, I'll see you. All right. No? Somebody say something. David? Uh, 
necessary here. Okay, no questions. Okay, let's make it a protocol for the remote people who want to ask. Do you have a question? Just put, uh, respond to the chat line, say no. Thanks. Send, a, send an act, please. Hi, so I'm Antonin. I work at Perfect Networks. Uh, I mostly do, I mean, I do a lot of open source P4 stuff and mostly in the realm of um, a runtime APIs for P4. So how do you control your P4 objects at runtime? So most of my work is actually user space uh, APIs for P4. And uh, I think in this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on the match action uh, part of P4 and how to uh, run that in the kernel and how to offload it to programmable hardware. And this is joint work with my colleague, Karam at Perfoot. Uh, okay. uh, so I'm, I'm going to give some background information about P4 in case some people are not very familiar with it. I'm mostly going to, I'm going to spend a couple slides on the notion of uh, P4 architecture, but I think it's important to understand what's going on here. Uh, and this is going to relate to uh, Matisse's proposal of a, a Linux target architecture. Uh, so first, uh, a, a small recap about P4 and TC or P4 versus TC. Um, what, what are the major differences and how they can work together? Uh, so they both use uh, match action processing. So you have P4 match action tables, that's a main object in P4. And you have like TC classifier action. So in, in concept, both of, both of them can do similar things. Um, one, one difference is that P4 tables have a fixed compile time list of actions. So when you define your P4 program and you define a table there, you give a list of actions which you can apply on the packet in case of match. And when you add roles at runtime to those tables, you have to pick one of those actions. You can't just give a new action. Uh, so my understanding is that's uh, one big difference. Um, but I think c conceptually, all of this falls into the category of like P4 is a programming language and it assumes a, a compilation step. Um, so you compile your program and you basically have that static compile database until the next recompilation and the next reconfiguration. And so I think one, one big difference compared to what you can do in software is that there is no incremental uh, compilation. You don't have like uh, APIs that let you uh, modify uh, the control flow graph, uh, the classifier action graph at runtime. And so why do we have this compilation step? Well, we try to have something which can be efficiently uh, supported across many uh, types of devices. And for example, in our case, uh, at Barefoot, with our uh, programmable ASIC, it's like, it's much easier if you have a global view of the pipeline once, because then you can compile it with some optimal allocation of resource. If I try to create like objects on the fly, one table, one table, one table, connect them together, I'm, I'm gonna have a very inferior uh, resource utilization, and I'm gonna be able to do much fewer things. Um, and I think P4 is a, a very powerful tool in terms of programming the database, while well, this is not, I think this is a strong statement, but maybe TC in my mind is more runtime programming for an existing database, at least some classifiers. And, and don't hesitate to interrupt if I say something stupid or if you have a question. Um, and so I think P4 is very good at describing your end-to-end -end, uh, packet processing place in, you know, in one place and, and because you have that description of your data plane with those objects, you can also generate some very nice control plane APIs for it. So P4 architectures, and maybe that's going to help like understand Max's proposal of uh, Linux target architecture. Um, so the P4.16 version of P4 introduces the notion of architecture. An architecture is a pipeline description. So what are the, uh, the different packet paths for my program? And it's a, a list of externs. Externs are some uh, specific packet processing functions that can be applied to a packet, which are not part of the core programming language. So this can be thought of as like a standard library functions. Um, 
so because of architectures, uh, in the previous version of the language, we are kind of limited to a single uh, switch abstract model. You had like an ingress pipeline, uh, you had like some queuing mechanism, and then an egress pipeline with a parser at the beginning and a deparser at the end. And that, that standard architecture was mostly thought out for, I would say, data center class switching ASEX, because uh, I mean, uh, there's no point in hiding it. I think it was mostly driven by barefoot and barefoot that is programmable ASEX, so that architecture was working well for barefoot. Um, so it was too limiting, especially once, when you want to define one network programming language that can be run on like Nix, uh, FPGAs, and so on. So in P416, a vendor can provide an architecture definition, which is tailored specifically to their hardware. So if I have an FPGA-based NIC, I can write an architecture with a pipeline description and a list of X terms, which are going to work optimally for my uh, hardware. Uh, there is an obvious problem, though, which is I kind of lose portability because now every vendor can define their own architecture, and if I move from one vendor to the next, well, I can't run the same P4 programs, and I have to uh, write new P4 programs. And so to counteract this in a way for people who are mostly interested in the portability aspect of P4, we have some standard uh, architectures uh, for different classes of networking devices. And you can think of them as like uh, the highest common denominator uh, between all devices in that specific class. And yeah, this shows the compilation step for uh, for a program. So um, you have a user-defined program which uses a vendor or community-provided architecture file, which is also written in T4. It goes through the compiler and you get some kind of, well, in our case, some kind of firmware uh, for your hardware. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that slide, but I just wanted to give an example uh, of an architecture. This is a portable switch architecture, which is a standard architecture for uh, data center switches, uh, mostly. And so, so you have like a very thick, fixed uh, pipeline to process packets, and, and the, uh, at the top the boxes in white or the boxes you can program through P4. And I also show the different packet paths, so it's, it's, a very, uh, it's very specific, and I think my point in showing this is that it's probably not going to be very adapted uh, to uh, Linux networking, and I guess that's, um, that's why I think the Linux target architecture is a good idea. So w one issue we often have with P4, and I want to say it's more like a, a challenge, something that needs to be uh, thought about, is that usually P4 means different things for uh, different P4, uh, for different people, sorry. That's not a, an exhaustive view, but like for some people, like if, I, I, if, I, if I'm selling a fully programmable uh, ASIC, maybe P4 is a great way for me of programming the uh, through target specific, uh, for a target specific architecture and getting the, the most possible resource utilization and performance out of my hardware. But for all the people who are more interested in, in, uh, in portability, for example, or they can use standard architectures and then it becomes a great way to achieve vendor independence to define a program which are going to be able to compile and run on, on different hardware. And often, I think the big challenge for P4 is I either get efficient hardware programming or I get something portable that I can run on, on multiple vendors. Um, and so what I think uh, uh, P4 can bring to Linux is, well, most obvious thing is a convenient way to describe Linux networking in one place as a single program uh, that people can refer to. Uh, it's to extend Linux networking, which is something we're interested in here. Uh, in a uniform manner, so I can I can modify my packet processing uh, without worrying too much about which underlying uh, forwarding engine is going to be used. And by forwarding engine, I mean here like some TC classifier or some eBPF VM. 
I think w one thing I have interest in doing, obviously, is uh, how to leverage uh, na natively programmable P4 hardware in the kernel. So uh, at first, when I started looking at that problem, I, I guess my first idea wasn't great in retrospect. And it was, well, maybe I can introduce a new P4 architecture for every class of networking devices I'm trying to control and, and, and write a special P4 program for all of it. So I could have like an XDP architecture and write a P4 program which is going to be running in XDP. I can have like different architectures, maybe for different CC classifiers and write different P4 programs. I can use a portable standard architecture for, uh, for switches and write a specific P4 program for this. And somehow I would find a way to have those P4 programs work together. Um, uh, like if, if I have a packet missing my ASIC, maybe uh, I have a way to punt the packet to my XDP program and so on. And I would be able to control those different components independently through their own respective uh, APIs. Uh, I would still use the ASIC SDK for the ASIC part and I would use eBPF math, uh, eBPF math sorry, for the BPF part. Uh, maybe this is an interesting way of building a network, but I'm not sure that's the right thing, that's the thing we're trying to achieve here. Um, because essentially, what well, you're seeing the SDK model for your ASX, and what we're actually trying to do is have a unified P4 program which can run in Linux and can be like seamlessly offloaded to programmable hardware when that hardware is available. So you have an island of many different approaches, like XDP, TC, as is, DPS, uh, and you're going to write a translated all of these things. So my, my original thought, but I, I kind of, we talked about this and I gave up on that, was like to write P4 programs targeted specifically at those different pieces you're referring to. And I thought about it and I don't think it's a good idea. So my idea is kind of like Maddie's idea to write a single P4 program and I'm going to get into this into more details for a Linux target architecture and have like the different flex blocks like seamlessly compiled and offloaded to those uh, different pieces. So plugs into the different pipeline, in the Linux pipeline at every hook you may want to add a P4 program. Yes. 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 Okay, that's your idea. Right? And, and based on the hook I can run it using a given TC classifier, or if it's early in the pipeline, I can run it next DP, for example. So, uh, somebody remote is saying something? I don't know who LEO is. Right. Yeah, keep going, I'll, I'll talk to him. All right. So the first thing you can do, which is pretty basic, because it doesn't give you a way to extend the packet processing path, is implement switch dev. Uh, implement the switch dev model using P4 and that PSA architecture I described early on. Uh, and basically what you get is like the fixed P4 pipeline uh, on which you can run an offload switch dev. So we implement like the offload functions on top of some generic P4 drivers. As vendors implement those generic P4 drivers um, and basically everything would work. Uh, uh, you would get switch dev offload for P4 native hardware uh, through those uh, new P4 drivers. Uh, and you would also, and then for legacy devices, never, nothing would change because they already offload uh, switch dev. So really all I would get from this is, well, apart from a P4 description of what's uh, happening in switch dev, which could be convenient, is I would really only get like the ability to uh, do offload for P4 native hardware. But that would kind of be a waste because I cannot use the programmability capabilities of that hardware. And if I want to add new features uh, to switch dev, I would need to update my P4 model, upstream those changes, uh, update my uh, switch dev DO ops. And so not optimal uh, for the end user. And so that's what it would essentially uh, look like, right? I would have my Linux.p4, which is not to be confused with the Linux target architecture that Mel has been describing, I would reuse an, an existing standard architectures and 
I would implement a switch up and you ops uh, using uh, the P4 uh, drivers, which you are called like, um, uh, which I call the PI API, and I, I'll describe this more in detail. But it's essentially just uh, P4 specific API, so I'm going to refer to it as P4 drivers. Any question on this? Um, yeah, so, and, and before I, I uh, kind of like bridge my talk with Matty's talk, um, I wanted to uh, spend some time just one side talking about the PI API, what I've referred to as the P4 drivers. Uh, so this is like a, a vendor independent API, uh, which is designed specifically for runtime control of P4 objects. So that API exists. It has functions like, oh, add this role to this P4 table, and very closely matches uh, uh, P4, because it was designed specifically for P4. So it's program independent, that's what PI stands for. It works with any vendor and with any new P4 program. When you write a new P4 program, that API is generic and it doesn't change. Uh, that API also supports like configuring uh, a, a P4 target with uh, a new P4 data pane, uh, which for Tofino means uploading, for, for barefoot ASIC means uploading a new firmware. Uh, to the hardware. Uh, it comes with a native serialization format, uh, and the expectation is that before programmable hardware can implement that PI application in an efficient, what I call, native way. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any sample code for that shows the, this API? Uh, I, I forgot to add a, a backup slide. Uh, okay. I, I guess I can pull it up if we have more time at the end or if there are questions. And so that switch the Linux.p4 approach like would work great. It would let us like offload uh, existing Linux functionality to to p4 programmable p4 native hardware. Uh, but it's not a great way to expose programmability to the user, and uh, have a good way to um, uh, extend what you can do in the networking space. Uh, and so that's where where I'm piggybacking on uh, Matty's talk. Uh, I think you first proposed that a flexible pipeline at the last uh, net dev. Um, so I'm stealing that idea from you with no, with no shame, but I did put your name, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, instead of taking your slide, you go through the trouble of creating a new uh, uh, yeah, diagram. So, so you proved it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I, I really like about this approach, I think it can be summarized in one important sentence, is that it's a top-down approach. Um, so like rather than looking at what already exists in P4, like that portable switch architecture, which is really targeted as at, at, at a specific class of ASICs, well, it, it, it asks the question, what is the best architecture I can think of for uh, Linux networking? And I basically, I look at what I want to do, which is like support existing uh, Linux networking and be able to add some programmability on top of that, and it comes up with like maybe not the perfect, but like a, a good architecture, a good solution for this. Um, so it's it's really designed around Linux and being able to offload Linux and not for the specific hardware that's going to be doing that offload. Um, and as Mali said, we're going to use like I mean the idea is to use various hooks in the kernel to run P4 custom code at those hooks uh, without disrupting existing uh, protocol processing. And what I like about this uh, architecture is we can we can start with just plain uh, Linux networking with the bridge and the router and all functionality, maybe one flex blocks and start doing some things. And then we can add a different flex blocks at a different hook point. And there is that ability to do something very incremental. Um, and I think there is also the ability to like test it because the regular Linux networking should still work in that approach. Yeah, if I provide like empty flex blocks, nothing should be different in theory. Um, obviously, one difficulty is that we need a parser and a departure. We need to figure out how to map uh, um, P4 parser and departure uh, to. Uh, Wait, why do we need a departure? I, I, I got the parser thing. You don't want to upset Tom, so you want to. We do your own, right? <laughs> but why do we need the departure? In, in Linux, we already have all the right pointers to construct the packet to send out. I, I think if you already know in, in which order the headers are supposed to go out, you don't really need a departure. 
So if I go back to the P4 early days, there didn't used to be a departure. You just have the parser, and then based on that, we would like build the parse graph, run a topological sorting algorithm on the graph, and figure out how the headers were supposed to go out. But there were some cases where that topological sorting wasn't unique, and then you could have actually some weird cases when you were adding headers in the pipeline that were not present in the original packet, where things would get re reverted based uh, right. compared to what you were, you were expecting. So the idea was to have like a non-ambiguous ordering for headers, and that's really all the departure is giving you. So maybe we don't need it. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really boils down to the case where you add headers in the pipeline which were not present in the incoming packet, so you, maybe you don't know exactly where to put them. Yeah, the, the other point is, even for the parser, you know, U32 has a built-in parser, essentially. I can yep. offset length. I look at the value, I compare with something. I don't need to pre I, it, It's a simple parser. I can, I can parse anything. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually thought that's what, maybe that's not what my proposal was. Uh, actually, my understanding was that we would more do like parsing on the fly as it's needed. So if I do TC32, I don't really need to parse, but if I convert P4 to BPF, uh, whether in XDP or in TC BPF, right. maybe I can do the parsing I need uh, in, in that same BPF module or whatever uh, the name is. So, so the flex could be, could it be a kernel module, or it could be a BPF program, or it could be... Um, well, I thought, well, I, 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 mean, I didn't say that, but I think one of, one of my objective was to do it without generating actual, I mean, I know eBPF is a, is some kind of, we had this talk uh, at the last uh, yeah. meet, right? The idea was to avoid generating like kernel modules because of commercial distributions. I mean, uh, yeah, that's Alex's point at the time. Uh, but, uh, okay, maybe we'll take that offline. If there's time, I'll, I'll bring it up again. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I, I guess one challenge with parsing on the fly is you don't want to break uh, existing uh, protocol. So, as Maddie said, if you have, like, a telemetry header in between L2 and L3, you still want to be able to parse that L3 header. Uh, and so, one interesting part is, so, actually, maybe it doesn't, yeah. So I, I decided to be a little bit more concrete here and actually show what the Linux target architecture uh, could look like uh, in P4. So when you define an architecture and with those flex blocks, you have to define precisely what the interface for each one of those flex blocks is going to be, what's available as an input parameter and what you can write as an output parameter. Um, and, and here I'm going to kind of reconnect with uh, Jamal's talk. Because um, in particular, you have to define the metadata which is available as input and needs to be provided as output. Um, so if, if you look at the Flex1 uh, signature, uh, well, you, you'll notice that you have that H header that comes, comes up all the time. So in P4, we assume that you do the parsing once. That, that doesn't mandate how you actually implement it, but in P4, the language, we assume that you do that passing up front at the beginning, and then you have a bunch of headers which are available throughout the pipeline. And so that H, like gen generic template-like parameter, is actually the header type which is available throughout the uh, uh, pipeline. And obviously, the architecture doesn't mandate what H is. Uh, it's up to the programmer, because the programmer can define its own new protocol. As any of that user metadata, which is also user provided, uh, which is available throughout the, throughout the pipeline. And so for this, maybe we could use like Jamal's proposal. I think one, 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 one issue I see with that, and I don't know how it can be fixed, is um, here I'm kind of assuming that that user metadata is available in every flexible block. Uh, and so Maybe we need to think about this. I mean, it's kind of convenient to be able to access some Flex1 metadata when you're in Flex2, but I don't know how it's going to work if like Flex1 is running in XDP and Flex2 is running in TCU32. How are, you gonna able, uh, how are we going to be able to pass that metadata from XDP to uh, TCU32? Yeah, that's, uh, so that's tricky. So my, my thought was only in regards to the TCE pipeline itself. So the 
there is a connection between, let's say, TCE, BPF, and XTP, because you can share data structures, like maps, for example, can be shared. But I don't know if, uh, I'll have to think. Maybe someone else has an idea how to do this. I mean, I, mean, I think it's acceptable, uh, at first, at least, to maybe limit the scope of metadata to a single flex block. And then we're going to have this issue, uh, hopefully, and see if we actually run into some serious limitations based on this. And so you also notice that there is some, what, I, what I'm going to call like standard metadata for each flex block. And that's the metadata, that's basically how flex blocks communicate with the fixed Linux pipeline. Um, um, yeah. Here, I, I, I didn't do very much research for this, so these are just some like ideas mostly on what kind of metadata would be available for the first flex blocks, for example. I think it makes sense that the ingress port would be available there. And I also put like a VLAN tag. Uh, and as the output metadata for the flex one block, what I, I put like a drop flag, maybe your flex one block has made like an early drop decision and you want to drop the packet right away. Uh, a for, forward flag with an next up index, if you've made like a forwarding decision and you want to apply it right away and skip the rest of the pipeline. And so I think it's going to take some time to define those uh, precisely and find exactly what's uh, right. Like flex two block runs after the bridge, and so in the input metadata for flex two, I put a, a bridge next up index. Uh, another thing I said early on is that um, you can have some externs, which are kind of like built-in for your architecture, built-ins for your architecture uh, when you define your new architecture, and maybe for some of those externs. This is kind of like a standard standard library of sorts. We could have like maybe some extras be some standard TC actions that cannot be expressed easily uh, in P4. Um, uh, not something like pedit, obviously, because I think P4 assignments are fine for pedit. Uh, but something like uh, what, what, what was the name? Mirrored. Mirrored. There is that action, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that an idea is to have it as an extern if it cannot be expressed easily in P4. So how do we compile and run those uh, flex blocks? So in my view, and I think here we're kind of converging to the questions at the end of Maddie's talk, like uh, uh, do I compile to BAPF bytecode and then I take that BPF bytecode and I offload it to hardware or do I compile my original P4 into some bytecode and something the hardware understands, some kind of hardware firmware? So my view is more like the second view. Um, and so flex blocks need to be compiled for both software and hardware. Uh, so for hardware, let's start with it because it's uh, easier. Uh, well, for P4 programmable hardware, for example, it's just going to be some vendor specific uh, binary or firmware. Uh, once again, that's not, that's not code that's meant to be executed. It's just like in our specific case at Barefoot, for example, it's how would you initialize your hardware registers? And, how do you uh, allocate your uh, TCAM and SRAM resources? And for software, well, that can be which classifier am I going to be using for this specific flex block or for that specific part of the flex block? I'm going to use a TC classifier. Am um, I going to generate some EPPF code, which I'm going to run into XDP, and so on? Um, and so the idea is that each vendor of native P4 hardware has to provide a compiler backend that understands this architecture, is a Linux uh, architecture, and can therefore generate the appropriate firmware for that specific, for, for the user provided P4 program. And, and, and because for software we have different like forwarding engines, different engines, different pieces that can run the P4 flex blocks, the idea is to have a Linux compiler driver um, that can compile flex blocks to run into the kernel. Um, and some work, as, uh, we don't start from scratch here, obviously. Um, uh, if you look at on GitHub, VMware has already contributed um, a P4C XDP compiler, so that generates BPF code that can be run in, in XDP. And so the idea is that that compiler driver for the Linux kernel would reuse uh, some existing compilers. Uh, I think P4C XDP is something that already exists, obviously, and we would need to come up something for the TC classifiers. 
So the question for so if you were to take that P four C to X D P, there'll there'll be a rewrite a little bit to fit into what you're saying, yes? There'll be a re I, I think it it's more about how to invoke it. Uh, figuring out how, uh, for which flex blocks we need to invoke it. And I, and I think for XDP it's pretty straightforward because you don't really have a lot of flexibility on when to run that code. But, and, and how would you know that you want to do before C XDP for a specific P4 program? Is there like a pseudo language that says I want to use well, this? So, yeah, I'm, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about now. I think it's, it's uh, not for a specific P4 program, more for a specific flexible block inside of that P4 program. I see. So, but, but I can target the same flexible block, flex block with multiple tag, with multiple outputs. Uh, when they say um, XDP, but maybe I just want to do TC ingress. Yeah, maybe I can have. I mean, I, I can skip XDP altogether and say I'm going to run into TC ingress. Uh, uh, but I can also do both, right? I can do flex one block in XDP and flex two in TC ingress. So it's up to the whoever is creating the policies or the we was compiling the P4 to decide. I think there are two things to look at. Here, I'm actually talking about this approach, but I think maybe <coughs> long term, there should be a way for the compiler to have some uh, brains and figure it out. Right? Yeah, I mean, I don't mind just telling it what I, that I, I want XTP, for example. Yeah, and, and so that's why I, I think we could have like, so P4.16 has this mechanism called annotations, which basically let you attach any kind of flags to P4 object. And you can define kind of like your own meta language uh, using those annotations. And basically, I have an example here. Next slide. Uh, what I'm saying is we could define like a new annotation. Here I call this Linux classifier, but it can really be uh, anything. And and basically, when you write your P4 program, you would be able to choose what's going to run that specific part of your P4 program in the kernel. The Correspond uh, answer your question. Uh, I think, yeah. So the exact granularity is like kind of two, you know, TBD. Um, I can do it on a control uh, base on the flexible block basis, or I can have like finer grain granularity and do it on a table basis uh, or table chain basis. So, I was following you until the last three statements, Linux, Classifier, XDP, uh, what have you. Why would that have to be in the program? Can't I just compile the P4 program and then insert it into the kernel at the given point and at, at the kind of a link time, let the kernel decide whether or not it can run it? Well, I think what, what your compiler is going to generate is going to depend on where you want to run that code. Uh, so it doesn't have to be in the P4 program, but that's information that needs to be passed to the P4 compiler. Because the P4 compiler is the one that's going to generate a BPF bytecode, for example. And my BPF bytecode, I imagine, can be different based on whether I run it in XDP or using TCBPF. Okay, so, so look at like XDP and BPF. So both of these will output BPF bytecode, correct? Yes. Okay, but the difference is in XDP we may use some helpers that aren't available. Exactly, yeah. That has to be part of the compilation uh, output. <laughs> and if that's why right now, if, if you look on GitHub, there is like VMware has developed a, um, a P4CXDP compiler that generates eBPF bytecode specifically for uh, XDP. And there is like a P4CBPF uh, compiler, which I guess is more meant for TCBPF, which is developed by the P4 community. Well, it turns out it's the same people developing it, but one under, oh, under the, one is under the VMware umbrella, and this one is under the P4.org umbrella. Um, yeah, so this is like kind of, I think one, one thing I'd like to say here to talk about the parser, and that's a thought that occurred to me when Mary was talking, is that on P4 I'm going to define that, that parser, and I think maybe we need to put some logic in the compiler which is going to answer that the parser you define is Linux compatible, which is like uh, uh, it extracts the required headers and your parser is uh, kind of makes sense for Linux uh, and corresponds to kind of like the picture that uh, Mali showed with a different, uh, uh, the parse graph that Mali shows. And I think we need to put that logic in the compiler and reject parsers that would actually not make sense for Linux. 
Uh, so here uh, I, I show like the, well, the Linux architecture uh, that we've been talking about. I've defined my own user program. And this is like the case of like P4 program of Wildware. So uh, I, 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 I showed the Tofino, compiler, Tofino case here in addition to the Linux case, but that's, we don't want to get stuck on that. As you see that your Linux compiler looks at your different flex blocks and is going to produce like different information based on where you want to run it, uh, basically. And so if my flex one block uh, is going to run in XDP, I'm going to generate some EBPF bytecode, which is going to run in XDP. Uh, if my flex two block was going to run in a TCU32 compiler, well, I don't really need to generate any bytecode. Um, however, in both those cases, you'll see that I'm generating some, I'm showing an extra file, which is a .map file. And the way I envision it, and I'm going to dig into more details in the next slide is, well, we kind of need some, if I, if I want to have like that software fallback and that hardware offload, um, and, and let's say my, one of my flex blocks is run into is eBPF, right? And so I'm gonna, if I want to use eBPF maps to, to populate those maps, I, I need to have like a standard P4 way of knowing how to offload those maps uh, to P4 programmable hardware, rather than relying on each vendor providing a driver, maybe for P4 programmable hardware, we can have like a single P4 driver and a standard way of offloading eBPF uh, to P4. Maybe So here I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to show the big picture of the control path. I think. I think we've covered my vision for the uh, configuration path, uh, which is well, I generate some output for. The, I, I use my compiler to generate some output for. Uh, oh, there is a scaling issue. No, but it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so I use my compiler to generate some output for the uh, for software. Uh, I use. It, different vendor specific compiler to generate my firmware uh, for a specific P4 programmable uh, device. So what happens at, at, at runtime for the control pass? Because I don't want to bypass the kernel, right? So I want to be able to use uh, my TC command line, for example, or my uh, eBPF maps, and I want those to be offloaded to hardware. Um, so I'm showing you a few things here. Uh, so, uh, and it's kind of like a shameless plug for me here because the P4 runtime is kind of my baby. Um, but the idea is, maybe, so I have a P4 program. So for those flexible blocks, so for the fixed blocks, obviously I want to be able to use the Linux tools. But for those flexible blocks, I want my application to be able to control them. And so I probably need some kind of user space application for them. And I'm proposing P4 runtime, as I said, a uh, shameless plug. It's a... It's a user space API, which is developed by uh, p4.org. Uh, the idea is to use PI, the API I, I talked about, as a generic driver uh, for uh, p4 native devices and have a way to upload uh, TC and XDP to those uh, generic p4 drivers. So, uh, sorry, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know how many people know what PI is. It's, who knows what PI is? That, that, that's the challenge you have. I, I know what it is, but there's somebody there that knows one, two. It would have been, maybe afterwards you can put like a, a simple program, but maybe just describe it in one. Like, uh, that's, that's, that's a very kind of simple C API, which closely, ma closely matches what's happening in the P4 program. And so for each, each class of P4 object, uh, there is a set of C functions to control that object, really. So tables, you can add roles, uh, delete roles, modify roles, uh, read roles, obviously. And then well, when you define like new objects for your architecture, you can define a new set of functions. So if we have like a stats object in the Linux target architecture, then we're going to have a function to read those stats and re reset those stats, uh, for example. So, so basically, PI is really like here, I'm proposing to use it as like a, a driver that's going to be 
placed in the kernel and that's going to let you control any kind of P4 native devices. The idea is because it's vendor independent, every vendor that claims to have P4 programmability can implement those, uh, those drivers on their uh, programmable device. Um, so, uh, I, I guess it, it can be confusing because there are two things here. Um, I mean, if the simplified view is P4 runtime, TC, and PI, for example, it's kind of strange because you've written a P4 program, you're programming your flex blocks, so you want like control plane applications to be able to use some kind of P4 interface uh, to talk to the object in those flex blocks. At the same time, you, want, you, don't, you don't want to bypass the kernel, so you kind of need to convert those P4 runtime messages into TC commands and eBPF maps commands, but then you're talking to uh, some P4 hardware, and so you need to convert it back to something which is kind of close to P4. And I think that that, that can be confusing. Uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. I still think it it, it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, um, and so different things need to happen, right? You need to be able to convert the and and, and you need like kind of a lot of information here, which is going to be provided by the compiler. So you need to know how to convert your P4 runtime messages to TC commands. And let's take an example. Let's say I have like two or three tables in one of the flex blocks, and I'm choosing to use like TCU32 uh, or TC flower even to implement those tables. So now I'm going to define like a TC chain with those three tables. Uh, and as I'm, I'm getting P4 runtime messages, I need to be able to convert them to a TC command for that chain, so I need to do, know the chain number, for example. So there is some information that's required here on how to map P4 runtime messages to uh, TC commands. And then there is information required, kind of like the symmetric information required to, to convert uh, uh, TC commands and offload them to hardware using the P4 drivers. So you kind of need to do the inverse translation. Not quite because P4 runtime and PI have some differences, but you kind of it's, it's, it's still kind of like the symmetric conversion. And so, yeah, essentially the compiler, the idea is that the compiler, hopefully this picture makes sense, and, and the compiler needs to generate two things. Uh, in the case of BPF, you need some BPF bytecode, and for all classifiers in general, you need some mapping information uh, that needs to be interpreted by the kernel that tells you how to map like TC and BPF map calls. So yeah, this will be essentially just uh, maps for uh, the maps to the Tofino table IDs, action IDs. Yes. Uh, uh, well, we didn't suggest Tofino. Yeah, but yes. Well, any, any hardware, basically. Do you, do you support uh, such IDs? So, so, so in, <laughs> when you say before hardware, it's uh, uh, sorry, yeah, we need the other mic. So I get the idea, and I think this is very interesting, and I, 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 I guess that it is quite generic, though uh, I think there is, uh, it's not mandatory for, if I'm, I'm looking at Maros Algo, for example, and our Algo can do before, but it can do before in hybrid ways, actually, I can actually skip the uh, before uh, random API in the kernel, part of it, sorry. At least uh, I can also bridge from switch there directly or IP and without the before runtime, and for TC, actually, it is good for us. So I think that yeah, uh, we, I, I imagine we can work together with that. We can have like the hybrid solution exactly. down at the driver level exactly. as well. Uh, but I think for flexible blocks, you guys do implement PI, maybe. Uh, yeah, we did that. Some Alan worked on PI in hybrid, we support PI in full. Yeah, so the, the idea is to try to have some generic drivers rather than yeah, that's that's, that's, yeah. that's cool. So, but but. It, Okay, so this is good for you two guys. Is there any Nick vendor that wants to say something about this? It, uh, basically, I think it boils down to you have some identifiers or 32 bit IDs. Are they 32 bit? That identify yeah. what the, the table is in the offload path, the action, each action has an ID running. Um, Alex, street <laughs> is here somewhere as well. So, do you want to say something about this? Please, if you don't mind. Where's the other mic? Right 
They made you work for nothing. <laughs> Should I go on? I think we're getting close to the end. Uh, yeah. So, kind of like, uh, I'd like to recap here and give maybe a higher level view of what's happening. So the idea is to leverage uh, the existing Linux pipeline and introduce some programmability through flex blocks rather than full programmability or uh, full legacy pipeline. Those flex blocks um, uh, can be realized in, in the kernel software using TC and XDP uh, and hardware offload happens through PI. I think once again to rebound on the conversation we have previously that that offload is the, the compiler produces two, still, you still have like two compilers, one for two compiler backends rather, one for the um, one for the Linux kernel and one for the hardware. I mean, at least in this proposal, and so you pro still produces you still produce a firmware that tells you how to configure your hardware, rather than try to do uh, configuration offload through the BDF, uh, through the BDF bytecode uh, like uh, Matty described. Um, yeah, we don't generate any kernel modules. Uh, hopefully, we can do it without generating any code. Um, and, and just an idea, maybe just like there is a rocker, I don't know if rocker is still a thing, just like we have a rocker device uh, for OSDPA, maybe we, had, we could have a rocker device that implements those generic P4 drivers I talked about, and then that would be a great way to test and experiment. And, and on the right, if it isn't obvious, I'm, I'm showing the different packet paths. Uh, so uh, packet can be entirely processed in hardware or, well, when you generate your firmware, you're in charge of like provisioning for uh, a software punt pass that's gonna, uh, so if you have like a table miss or something, you can, or you don't know how to process that packet, you can fall back to software. Um, and obviously maybe the packet is meant for me and then I go all the way to user space. So I, I don't know, did the Nick Winters respond on whether you can do the table ID, action ID mapping? Ronnie, you, you, you don't sound interested in saying anything today. Oh, okay. I think the switch use case and the NIC use case are totally different, right? Because in the switch, you're, you're, you're using the, 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 the Linux instance to configure and manage a switch. Yeah. But in the smart NIC case, you've got um, uh, network layering and termination. Your actual target is end applications, whether they're in VMs or containers or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right. That's a very and also the rate of change uh, for configuration and other things. Um, and in some cases, people want to program even using uh, BFP. They want to program even what's in the socket layer. They want to do things there. They might want to and they have, they have a distinction between. I consider this an underlay network. So that in, in, a, in a data center server, you have the underlay network, which is essentially the, uh, and you have a mapper, a vSwitch for that. And then you have the overlay networks that are on top of that, right? Um, so it's, it's I think, a very different model. Yeah. Other thoughts? But specifically regarding the drivers, if, if I take Xilinx FPGA, for example, uh, and, and Nix based on that, they support like P4 natively. So they still kind of need some P4 drivers. Uh, I would kind of, I, I, I accept that uh, data plane programming is going to be completely different, uh, but maybe for the control pass, there could be some value in using the same P4 generic drivers. Remote, anybody wants to say anything? Um, yeah, I have a comment. Yeah. So let me raise it up. What is the primary goal here? Is it to introduce P4 programmability into Linux networking? Or is it to do that in order to basically configure and manage uh, switch hardware or possibly NIC hardware at some point? I think, I think the, the first goal should be uh, I'm sorry, the main goal should be the first one you described, which is have, have a way to introduce P4 programmability and in the, in, in the kernel. 
obviously, my personal interest is also to have a way to offload that to, to hardware. But I guess you can do the first one without doing the other. I still think that the Linux target architecture would be a good way of doing it, independently of whether you try to make it work on the switch or not. Okay, so if it's first case, then I think it's pretty clear that there's going to be, I don't want to say conflict, but obviously some um, evaluation, BPF versus P4. And one of the slides you had, you actually had XDP offloading to a P4 device. That can only happen if the XDP program started as P4, right? Because it's going to be BPF programs we load into XDP that cannot be put into P4 device, but I think there's you can go from P4 to BPF, but it's much harder to go from BPF to P4. Can, can I interject? Uh, hmm? Can I interject? Uh, so I just want to say something. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, by all means. No, no. So the, 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 the difference with BPF is uh, you can't... So P4 is a generic way of to describe what you do on the data path without necessarily it being TC or... Uh, you generate BPF out of P4 as opposed to be the other way around, right? So it, they, they, are, they are not mutually exclusive. I think they are orthogonal to each other. Right. Uh, fair enough. So, so in this slide, there's this um, new apparent uh, entry point, NDO P4. I think that could be contentious if you try to put that on stream, right? Because now you're basically introducing a new programming paradigm as uh, a core part of the kernel, maybe it would be NDO offload or something like that. So I think there's going to be some subtle subtleties here, and maybe it's inevitable that you see this PR so and BPS. If, if you, this diagram that he has, it, my understanding of your diagram, is, if I got it correctly, like, is there the one that's generic which doesn't show up to like maybe? So if this was to be uh, a uh, netronome, that tofino.bin would be a BPF program that is compiled for Netronome. It exposes the northbound interfaces for how you, you configure it to the kernel. And those northbound interfaces are what the P4 run, PI API plays with, am I correct? Yep. I, I don't know if you want to download the eBPF program through this API. <laughs> it's more sort of the control piece. Well, the question is, is that the same exact program? So if I can run the same exact program in XDP, and then just download that same program to the device. That's true offload. I think there's another variant which is more like, well, I can download the program in the software in one variant. I can download the program in the hardware in another variant. Right. right. That may be completely separate paths at that point. I thought, I thought I agree. At least uh, we are targeting to the, to the offload approach, trying to skip the direct path to the firmware or to the device and actually uh, use switch dev in order to configure the hardware. Hopefully we will be able, uh, I hope that we will be able to do that, but I, um, I, 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 I don't know that. Um, I'm not sure that we will be able to um, um, like reverse adding EBPF program and the bytecode into um, the hardware. And EBPF currently look like the only way we have to um, actually um, introduce or express in the kernel uh, complex or flexible uh, um, data path. So we will work on that hopefully in, in the next level in the plumbers will have more info on that. So, so I can just, I think in the, net, uh, in the nature of the case, everything above the red box and the NDOP4 can be the same. Uh, you would still be able to use P4 and generate PPF, but then as you said, uh, uh, the PPF offload would be like native uh, PPF offload. Yeah, I think that the value is that if I don't want to, if I don't have to do how to offload, I can still write the same control application. Whether I offload or not, it's the same code. It's, it's just going to be slower because it runs the software. Right, and I, I suspect if the term P4 doesn't appear in any cur kernel code, core kernel, code, that's probably an advantage too. You can abstract it out as something else. Yeah, I, I, probably so the that. red box in, 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 the, in his diagram doesn't really, it's uh, the PI API is basically key value metadata. It's totally transparent to the kernel, basically. But if you just wanted to program the blue box, it doesn't have to 
I think Tom was referring to all the way to the hardware. I think Tom was referring to the NDOP for here. Yeah, I, I, I love it because even if I have a Tofino or a Mellanox chip, I can still test on my laptop and give you a demo for how this works. And then when it when it when it's appropriate, I'll set the right flags and it will just use the hardware control uh, through the control interface. Um, I don't. Th there is already a TC NDO that offloads TC today. So is that you're seeing this as very similar to that? Am I correct? Yeah. XTP and, and BPF make a lot of sense for, for this, right? And Am I out of touch? We're not doing too well, but... Uh, I, I can stop here. I already have one more slide, and it's kind of controversial, so I'm not too eager yeah. to... I can skip it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's... Lada, you, maybe you could go next? for 30 minutes, and then we take a break, and then come back. We may have to put off the people at the end of that agenda. Okay, do you want to go next, or you want to go after lunch? You can go next? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so just to, uh, do you have flat slides? This is the classifier. It was supposed to be after, but... For this, or you know, maybe. Yeah, you think you could you could do this because you don't need slides, right? You can just show some code and demo quickly. I think uh, Vlad, maybe you do it after lunch because Kong is going to be awake at that point, and you're talking about a lot of logs, and he wants to talk about TC logs. So let us run you after lunch, maybe. Okay, so th this one, there's no slides. The workshop, you don't have to have slides. You can just stand there and wrap if you want, as long as it's relevant. They, these guys just have code and a small demo they want to show. So it's related to P4, so maybe it's a good segue as well. Uh, I'm involved in this, but these guys wrote the code. <laughs> I'm just taking credit. <laughs> uh, and... It's, it's a, using the p-edit action uh, and taking a p are, are you going to show a p4 program that converts to, Craig, what are you showing? I'm going to show a p4 program. Right. It's converted to tc. Okay. So, so, okay. Can we help have control of this screen? Yeah. Oh, wait, I got it. See what I'm talking about. So, uh, as Jamal mentioned, our, our goal was to uh, take P4 code and translate it into a basically a working TC script. So, uh, it's a, bit, a little more straightforward than what you guys are doing. But um, so, I'm going to start by showing a simple. I can use my mouse. You've tested this, right? Of course. So the funny thing is, actually, we we tested everything, and then my my machine like crashed like ten minutes ago. So I had to try to set everything up. So some of the uh, some of the demo parts may not uh, work perfectly, but um, so anyway, this uh, on uh, my left, uh, there's a this is a simple P4 program. Uh, so just a few things I want to highlight. I'm no, I'm no P4 expert, but uh, a few of the things I want to highlight is that the, the P4 has definitions for the different 
headers that it's going to be processing. For example, it has the I'm trying to figure out how to work this mouse. But anyways, you can see that the Ethernet header, there's a representation of the Ethernet header and the IPv4 header. Um, each table specifies, or each of those structures specifies the, the layout of the specific header that we want to deal with. Uh, there's also There is also, if I can, there's also this table which specif where we can specify keys that will be matched to action. So in, in this little presentation, I'm going to focus on this uh, IPv4. forward action. So we're, we're matching on the IPv4 destination header and if we if we find a key that, that matches and we want to execute this IPv4 forward action. Uh, the action itself is just defined above here. Uh, so just, just to people watching the Dev21, this is very similar to what all presented on behalf of uh, I, Amir Vadai, I think, for the Miller House Connect X5 in, in Montreal last time. That P4 program looks like that, right? You have um, some metadata, you decrement the TTL by one, so you Miller House added uh, P edit extensions to decrement TTLs and um, swap MAC addresses, I think. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, so this. Yeah, so, I mean, Jim already touched on this, but this IPv4 forward action, um, it's going to set some metadata. So, we, Jamal talked earlier about how that's actually a work in progress, so we haven't implemented that yet. Then um, it's going to swap or copy the destination address over the source address, uh, set the destination address as a user programmable parameter that's passed as part of this IPv4 forward action, and finally, decrement the TTL value. So to convert this to TC, uh, there's two components. There's the, there's the key matching component that actually picks out what action we're going to execute, and then there's the actual action itself. So to, to do the matching, we're going to use, we're converting uh, to the U32 classifier uh, and the actual packet processing components are implemented using the, the p-edit command. So now I'm going to show, I can use my mouse here. So as an intermediate step, uh, we actually Evangelist did, did this work. So uh, we, we created a JSON representation of the, the P4 uh, data structures. So if you look at the screen on, what's on my right, um, corresponding to, for example, our IPv4 header, Scroll down a bit. So, uh, you, you have like three yeah, four so minutes left. But oh, so maybe five. <laughs> Are you going to talk as well? Yeah? Okay. So, the idea here is this is very different from, let's say, what these two earlier speakers were talking about. Here we're generating scripts. You take a P4 program, you generate TC scripts, and you only use U32 and P edit. And in some cases it works, and in a lot of cases actually. What's missing is the metadata. U32 is capable of doing all the parsing that's necessary through offset length values. Go, go ahead, sorry. No, thanks. Uh, so, anyway, you can see in the, the JSON, we, uh, for each 
um, header type, we have the, the different fields. Uh, and in the, we, we support three different pedit commands and one uh, U32, so a command, the U32 has to support matching. So you can see this uh, match command here. Uh, so this is the conversion. So for example, for the, uh, which field is this? Let me go to destination address. So to match on the destination address, this is the corresponding uh, U32 code. Uh, to add to the destination address, this is the, the p-edit. It's a snippet of p-edit code it's a, and so on for setting the uh, destination address. Apologies, it's a little tricky to operate this. Oh, okay, sorry, I already have it there. So if you can see here, there's uh, this is the actual command we we use to generate the can people see the TC version. Can you? Yeah, in the back, you can see that. So maybe make, make it a little... Uh, well, I don't want to, we don't have much time, so... <laughs> okay, maybe just explain what it is. Anyway, so it's... Um, uh, so this is a P4. Uh, it's supposed to mimic what, a, what you do creating a regular TC filter. Uh, so we, we add a filter. The filter is this, uh, the key is this IPv4 LPM, which is the, the table from our uh, P4 file. If I can, maybe I deleted it. Um, we're creating this on this V device. Uh, if I supply the parent, the, pro, the protocol, the IP, the key here is the IP address of the, the V ETH. Uh, or the container that we're sending traffic to. And then the other important part is this IPv4 forward um, component. So that's the actual action, or the P4 action we're deploying. And the port and destination address are the, the parameters that it, that it took. Uh, so when we run this script, uh, at the very bottom here, it's a little difficult to see, but that's the that's the resulting um, TC script that we generate from this. Uh, at each step we show here, for example, to copy the, the destination address to the source address, it's, it's accomplished through these three, you can see here, these three uh, p-edit munch commands. And then just, if I can, really quickly. Demonstration of this in action. Uh, Great, you got like three minutes, maybe three yes. minutes. Yeah, yeah this will be because he, he wants to talk about the NK edit as well. So, uh, give a summary. So anyway, this this little script has just deployed our our rule, and then I'll show you the deployed uh, the deployed rule. This is a little actually easier for you folks to read, I think. Um, so at the, the top here, we see uh, the match is on the, the IP address that we specified, uh, and the, the p edit command. So we're, we're copying data. We're also setting the, the MAC address um, that the user provides as an input parameter. We're decrementing the time to live value. Uh, and these others are just, um, we redo the checksum, and finally we redirect it to a mirror. This is for our, for our own testing. Let this run. So that's about it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so very friendly commands, as you can see. You know, yeah, the, the syntax is amazing. But uh, what, what you saw earlier on is he was able to create something that if you know the P4 program, you'll understand what the command line means. And it's support. In theory, look, if you have a program that's doing this, not a human being, it's okay. 
I don't see anything wrong with it. Really. You want to talk about the key edit challenges or? Okay, so we had to add a feature to, to peer edit. Roman added a feature to peer edit to copy uh, from one offset to another. That, was, that is needed, let's say, on a swap mark address. So, so uh, uh, for those of you who don't, uh, who don't know, the peer edit is a TC action that allows to uh, modify the arbitrary data in the packet. And uh, under the hood, it operates with 32-bit uh, chunks of data, so it always reads 32-bit. But through the masking, you can extract either U8 or U16. And uh, at the moment, it has only two uh, operands. It's add and set. And clear or invert are subsets of set. So as part of our work with this P4 uh, compiler, we realized that we need to add a copy command that would basically copy from X to Z. And, uh, um, that, 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 that this is what you can see in, uh, uh, in the output of command if it's uh, visible. Um, key zero at minus eight, copy, and so on. So it means we read from the offset minus 16, uh, this many uh, bytes, zero, 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 F, 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 means we read basically two bytes from this 32-bit chunk and copy to the offset minus eight. Why offset is negative is because the, as we call it, global offset of the packet points at the network header. That's why we have to <coughs> shift backward to, to reach the uh, Ethernet header. In this, in, in this example, we uh, basically swap the source uh, destination, uh, sorry, destination uh, MAC address with source and set the, um, the, other, the other way around. Um, so, this is still work in progress, and we would like to uh, improve this uh, implementation in such a way that it re more reminds the mem copy, which means, say, from here to where and how many bytes to copy, instead of uh, building these cryptic uh, commands filled up with offsets and, uh, and the masking. So, uh, this is, this is basically it. That's, uh, so whoever will be interested to see how it operates can ping me and I can show on my laptop because the correct system is a bit unstable as a result of demo effect. So uh, this is it. So everybody sees the challenges with this. So what do you think you, you would, this would be useful for you as well? So like, can you do offload? Uh, a copy, say, copy from this offset, you can. Eh? So this could be offloaded as well. Okay. Maybe uh, you're planning to send patches at some point? Yes, at some point. Okay. Any questions? Uh, we'll call it a break, uh, but we're behind schedule a little bit. So uh, just be back exactly on time, which is. Thanks, Roman. So back after lunch says uh, 15 minutes before 2, so 13.45, you have one hour and 15 minutes break. Be back on time, please, so that, because we're behind schedule a little bit. We're going to get started now. Uh, let's just wait for those people to come in. <coughs> All right, I'm just handing it to you. Hello. Okay. So my name is Lad. I'm from Mellanox, and I like to talk about uh, effort which I've been doing since autumn. It's paralyzing TC rules update. So basically, TC already works, and hardware of loading in TC already works. So why do we need it anyway? Because you can configure rules. Every, all infrastructure is there, so why? Who needs millions of rules? Uh, I work in team, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, you see, there are people who need this kind of stuff. So my team, uh, we're providing hardware of loads for OpenV switch, and it turns out there are a lot of people like Jamal who wants to be able to configure millions of rules, and uh, they want to do it fast. They don't want to wait minutes for their rules to 
to be provisioned to hardware. So I think uh, every one of you knows what is open with switch. It's a soft switch running with hypervisor or control stack for silicon. It's directly copied from open with switch website. And uh, in case of our Connectix card for Mellanox, and uh, when it does uh, hardware of loads through kernel, we leverage TC in kernel infrastructure to do this. And uh, open with switch itself, it's multi-threaded application. It can use any number of cores we give to it, and uh, especially with uh, DPDK. And with the, but we want to do this with kernel. And uh, the problem is that uh, TC infrastructure is completely locked by one big lock, RTNL lock. And uh, so even if you provide 100 threads for open with switch, it will still be stuck waiting for RTNL lock. And, uh, by Amdahl's law, you know, if you have 10% of your uh, time spent on some critical section, you still will not be able to leverage parallelism for more than, more than 10 threads, for example. And I think in this case, it's even more, it's like 30% of time is spent in kernel under RTNL logs. So, you see? So, you can have a bunch of handler threads, revalidator threads, but then you have to go through the kernel and RTNL mutex ruining everything for you. So, kernel TC architecture. Uh, I reviewed some previous talk, uh, talks about uh, people were uh, giving about TC and about OVS, and some of them said that it can take 100 milliseconds uh, of holding uh, RTNL lock for some task. Actually, it's even more, as you can see. You can easily lock it up for almost two seconds. I just configured two millions of rules, and I deleted the queue which holds them, and for two seconds, you cannot uh, create any new rules, QDisk, you cannot change IP address or interfaces. And with hardware of loads, it will be even worse because it will include all the time it needs to remove these rules from, uh, from your uh, NIC. So that's basically why RTNL lock usage is so bad currently for, uh, pro for programs like OpenV switch. And uh, the another problem with it is that completely related tasks rely on the same lock. So it's not per interface or something. It's really a global lock. So whatever you send in something through Netlink, it probably takes RTNL lock and uh, holds any other users. It can completely lock them out. So what is currently there? So orange box is uh, part of the stack which holds RTNL lock. So as soon as you do Netlink receive, it determines the type of Netlink message handler which should handle this message. And if it's not unlocked handler, it takes RTNL lock. So basically all the classifier API, all the flower infrastructure, action API, and then your driver, everything happens while holding this lock. So you cannot do much parallelism with this kind of architecture. And uh, the problem with this is it's historically all the code in this infrastructure assumed that uh, you hold RTNL locks. So people, of course, people have this magic lock which holds everything for them and they start to rely on it in all kinds of situations. That, uh, for example, that your interface will not be removed, that no one will delete the queue disk, no parallel modification is possible. So it spreads the whole infrastructure because this one big lock is convenient. Of course, it's convenient for implementers to use. So that's uh, from point of view of uh, rule create infrastructure. That's how data structure looks like. So you obtain QDisk from interface, then you obtain block, then you look up the chain, then TP, then filter, then action. And, and as you can see, it's already kind of tree-like structure. So it's only natural that, can, that you can lock only some nodes in it, right? You don't have to lock the whole tree. I mean, it's, it's obvious, right? So if you go to insert filters and actions here, the orange line for people on that part, part of audience, of course you don't have to block all other people. I'm not even talking about completely unrelated Netlink message handlers, like changing API, or IP address or whatever. Just e even inside the tree, you don't need to block all these guys. So here you see you can only lock here the dashed line, and these guys should be able to work in parallel to each other. So my proposal is uh, to completely remove RT RTNL lock from this stack. As you can see, now uh, all the user space thread can completely call the send the Netlink message and they supposed to be handled in parallel. And uh, 
as on the right, you can see the data structure picture. It's shortened one, not the original, but it describes some changes that I made. So it's not some fancy algorithm which magically does it for you. It's just a lot of small changes in all infrastructure. Like some, sometimes I had to add a reference counter. Sometimes reference counter was already there, but it was not actually used. Uh, it's used, for example, for a block. A block can be shared between Q disks. So you, you have the reference counter for a Q disk. But uh, the reference counter for QDisk was not taken when you add the rules on this QDisk because it's assumed that uh, if you hold RTNL lock, no one can remove QDisk anyway. So you just incre increment the counter if, if you add additional user for QDisk, but not when you work with QDisk. So I had to change the logic with works with uh, QDisk. And sometimes there were no, no reference counting at all, so I had to add reference counters. And of course, I had to add locks, which lock uh, like linked list, IDRs, whatever structures which are not uh, safe to modify in parallel. It's a bunch of small changes, and it adds up to like 60 patches already. Uh, I will talk about uh, patch status afterwards. I think I'm getting ahead of myself. So it took some code refactoring, some additions, and uh, okay, development status. And uh, with these additions, where we stand now, some of it is already upstream, uh, some of it is pending on code review. Uh, and uh, what I did is, of course, I changed uh, classifier API and action API to allow this unlocked access. And uh, all actions were changed uh, to also allow unlocked access, but not all filters, not all classifiers in QDisk because they are very complex in implementation. So I, of course, don't want to go through all possible classifiers and modify them. But I did it for classifiers, which is used by OVS, OpenV switch, in case of hardware flow, which is Flower classifier and Ingress QDisk. And the way I changed the interface, I added flux field, flex field, and you can set a flag that this classifier or QDisk doesn't require uh, caller to hold RTNL lock. Okay, so why are we doing that in first place? Because we want to leverage parallelism to get better performance. So in, for single threaded performance case, uh, some patches were already submitted before. I think some of them by my colleagues, like for example, they changed some linked list, uh, which meant you have linear search to IDR, which is tree-like structure, so you have logarithmic search. So we already improved the single threaded case, and uh, there is not much you know you can do with <laughs> single thread and comparing to current CPUs, which have tens of cores. So benchmark, which I did, is very simple. I do, did not want to hard code anything. It's just a bunch of, uh, bunch of batch files for TC. <laughs> and I did it on my CPU. It's middle of the line CPU, 12 cores. Again, no fancy hardware, no hard coded stuff. And what I do is just I run with Xargs, multiple instances of TC, and, and each TC has its own bunch of files and I measure how much time does it take to insert uh, millions of rules and delete millions of rules, you know, to expose any kind of uh, this linear searches or something which doesn't scale well with number of, uh, number of rules inserted. So I'm insert 2.4 million of rules. Why is this number? Because they're 12 cores, and it's easy to divide to 4 by 12. And if, you have, if your rule count is too small, you will probably measure just TC startup start time and uh, time it takes for XARCs to run multiple instances of TC. So it has to be some reasonable number of flows, but also not too, too many because you can't even dump them to count. There was a long standing bug, which meant that uh, dumping flower classifiers is uh, quadratic in complexity. So if you have, for example, 5 million rules, Today I left uh, my setup overnight to just try, try to count 5 million rules on Flower, and it wasn't finished by morning. I <laughs> already submitted a patch to fix this, but it's just a funny example of how many parts of this infrastructure currently are not optimized for this kind of load, loads. Uh, so use cases which I tested, so it's not a marketing presentation, so I'm not only just, you know, testing rule insertion to standalone interfaces and telling you that we, have, that we have absolute scalability. I test some very worst possible use case when I insert the same filters to same uh, TP instance, which basically means that, uh, okay, let go to my previous slide. So worst use case is when we insert to same filters and actions. Let me show you. 
Yeah. These guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, that one. Supposedly. Yeah. So this is the worst case scenario, and some better scenarios is when uh, I'm inserting rules to standalone chains, which means you only share the first node, and as soon as you looked up the chain, you insert a different uh, classifier instance. Some uh, rule type, again, it's five tuple plus source and destination MAC address, and uh, for uh, stand standalone chains, uh, each file has different chain index, and when I test the worst case, it all goes to the same chain. And again, shared action which is when I provide the same index for action, which means that only first rule creates the action, all other rules share this action. It's uh, kind of just a way to test uh, which uh, part consumes more CPU action code or rule creation code. So worst case scenario, when we insert into very same TP instance and we have to increment the very same reference counters, where it's take very same locks. Uh, it's uh, one, one instance of TC, three, six, and 12. As you can see, even without uh, removing RTNA lock, we still get some improves in three instances and why? Because obviously some part of uh, TC is user space and when you run it at parallel, you parallelize the user space part, but not kernel space part. And that's why we see that uh, vanilla kernel does not improve performance with number of uh, cores. Because as soon as you parallelize the user space part, kernel space part cannot be parallelized. And in case the the blue bar is unlocked kernel insertion and dark green is unlocked kernel deletion. And as you can see, it continues to scale with number of cores used. The delete, by the way, does not scale very well. And why? Because delete is basically just removal of uh, your uh, classifier, uh, of your filter and your action from shared data structure like IDR, and you have to lock. And, and all your work is locked anyway because you target in same data structure which contains them. There is uh, not much to be gained from parallelization. And you can also see that performance even somehow uh, gets worse with, uh, when you have uh, like more than six threads. And if you look at profiling data, it's because they are just <laughs> trying to obtain uh, spin lock, which probably. So this is for the worst case scenario? Yeah, this it's slide? a delete in worst case scenario, the one which okay. performance even decreases uh, with number that, of That's lock. the RTNL lock? The cute spin lock at the top? No, it's not RTNL, it's internal spin locks which protects the IDRs, all kind of shared data structure. But it's worst case scenario because we're ta targeting exactly the same uh, classifier instance, exactly the same TP. And uh, when you delete, you don't do anything much besides parsing initial message and then right. removing it from all the shared data structure, which you have to lock anyway. That's why, as we can see, the threads are just trying to update, uh, to obtain RT to, to obtain the spin lock and not doing much uh, actual work. Mm -hmm. So, okay, reducing lock contention. First of all, we can use shared action. So instead of creating action per rule, we only create one action and then all other rules are attached to this action. And uh, uh, that means that uh, we are no longer using the action IDR for modification or for lookup. And uh, we are not allocating per CPU counters, which is also kind of bottleneck uh, because internally per CPU counters uh, also have lock. So in best case scenario, for example, when you target different interfaces or different chains, you will see in profiling data more and more of uh, per CPU code showing up because they have locks and it's a relatively heavy operation. Maybe it can be improved for somehow pre-allocating them. Uh, I did not try it yet because uh, this patch set uh, mostly about the enabling parallelism <laughs> itself. And it's not about any kind of optimization which applies to everything. Just removing RTNL lock, which will, of course, allow us to do some small changes to leverage the parallelism to the maximum. So this one is a different chain and, of course, a different TP. You see that it scales very well because now we don't share this data structure, only initial lookup, as soon as you looked up the chain and TP, you don't have a any more uh, interference between threads uh, b besides the per CPU counter allocation. In this case, you can see that both delete and uh, create scales uh, very well in this scenario. 
maybe someone has any questions. I see people are silent, but does everyone knows how TTC, basic, basic TC architecture, because maybe people, some people don't know what is the chain TP filter, how it all, all fits together? Yes, I, I have a question. So you have 2.4 million rules. Total, yeah. In the 12th thread, which are actually 12 instances of TC, so 12 processes are running. Yeah. Each one is doing 200,000. Yeah. So is it possible that maybe one of them finishes ahead of time? And sure. what, What's your um, jitter? Is there a jitter in your results? Like there's a... Come again? Jitter. Like jitter? It, yeah. Do you get consistent results all the time? Like uh, how many times do you Not very consistent. 10% yeah. percent difference. Okay, I would not, not call not it too consistent. Difference. Probably if I had coded somehow internal, I can get much more consistent result, but yeah. I want, wanted to have tests which are completely reproducible by anyone. You know, no magic hard-coded stuff which no one can verify for themselves. Just user space TC run in parallel with Xargs and batch files. But the di difference is very big. I mean, 10% jitter will not give you <laughs> that much difference. It's like yeah, yeah. 3.5 times. <coughs> okay, it's for combining two approaches. It's both using sharing ac shared actions, so only one action is created and targets different chains. So it's, oops, sorry. Uh, Still 500, less than a million a second? Let's compare. F for delete, yes, but for insert, you can see that we have much better results for rules insertion. So I get like, like yeah, five mi half a million per second. Yeah. Uh, Kong, you have any questions remote? Mike, use the mic, please. Uh, Mike, Mike, where's Mike? <coughs> so uh, uh, these rules are added to TC layer in software or in the hardware? It's a software because uh, first you have to do software implementation in order to be able to implement the parallel driver itself because uh, driver, uh, all drivers currently also assume that you hold the RTNL lock. And the part of this patch set will be to give the drivers uh, the interface to register uh, block and ECDF callbacks uh, that do not require caller to hold RTNL lock. So this one is without hardware yet because we, haven't, we don't have a driver fully implemented for this until we get it upstream. we are getting around 500k per second insertion. That's yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, I, would, I would expect the, soft, uh, the hardware may be a little slower, but I don't know. Uh, yeah, of course hardware will be slower because first of all you also call driver, which is an, another piece of code to run, and you need to wait to send something to, to hardware and wait for some ACK or NAC, some results. So. But that also means that you don't get so much lock contention in shared case, so my uh, internal results with preliminary drivers so, uh, get me very nice results of linear scaling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so can we do uh, flow dumps also in parallel while we are adding the rules? Uh, that would be Excuse interesting. <laughs> do, do what? Uh, Dumping while you're adding. Dumping while adding. I think OVS does it, right? Basically, while adding the rules, the other revalidator threads keep... Yeah, revalidator it. threads do dump in yeah. parallel while, crea while creating. Yeah, so... When you are locked, yeah, you can do in parallel, insert and delete rules while you dump in them another thread. I did not test such test case, but yes, it will be possible with this patch set. They will no longer interfere. Oh, so they don't interfere? Yes, because uh, uh, update uh, pass, pass does not hold RTNL lock, so there is no way to exclude it. You know, when you don't have one big lock, you have to account for all cases like this. Okay, thanks. So do you have any numbers for hardware? I know that uh, Ronnie one time bragged that he can do a million a second, but is it this, you're using the Connect X5? Yeah. Can you do, uh, do you think this, uh, you can handle this kind of rate to your hardware? Like, say there was no overhead. The hardware itself can handle it, but what we get, uh, I mean, first we need to parallelize the driver and see m maybe there are some bottlenecks in driver also. Right. So that's why I'm not showing any data for the driver because I don't have driver ready and it, 
this, this patch is at least reviewed internally and some of them upstream. But for, for driver, I did not even start internal review. So I don't want to give you any bullshit numbers. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so you, but it's possible to parallelize the access to the driver. So Connectix yes. uh, multi-core hardware. You, it's yes. already multi-core. You just need to call it in parallel. Is the driver in, any changes needed in the NDO or just the same one? So I'm not that. I don't know if you know Ronnie. He's from your company. <laughs> no, did you change anything in the NDO? No. Not yet, but I didn't finish a driver yet. I only did uh, some implementation which allows me to do uh, simple rules like GACT, stuff like this. And uh, we support a lot of stuff in drivers. So I don't want to commit any st for yeah. to anything on video until at least uh, internal so, review. So I indeed we saw that it's improving also the hardware insertion because other hardware is, can do parallel. Our framers can work with multi-thread. And we still continue working and improving it. We understand that yes, we well, want I, to go I, I like soft. It. Yeah. That's the hardware. <coughs> and we have some uh, internal demo that we are doing that we can have uh, uh, more than half a million, almost a million update per second. Okay. But it's not production yet. Mm. We would not be doing it if it did not give us advantage for our hardware, yeah. <laughs> right? No, I, and that's the reason that we work, we work also for TC because, you know, if, uh, if TC is not supporting that and we're going through TC, that's, yeah, that so will be the bottleneck. So, you know, you we're working in parallel yeah. directions. But last time you said you, you said you could do a million, so I'm still seeing 500,000 there. It's, <laughs> it's software. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a skip, so, a skip hardware. Yeah. Um, well, I'm expecting the hardware to be slower if this is a bottleneck. Yes. Right. So, but, okay, maybe you can take this offline. I think your hardware is, tables are accessible through regular memory, right? Your memory mapped. Yes. So it, c it may not be a big overhead, I don't know. Yes, so that, that's how we can implement one million, yes. Okay. Uh, Kong, do you have any questions? I don't know if you can hear me. Kong? Akon, can you hear me? Do you have any questions for uh, I can Vlad? I hear you. You have any questions uh, for Vlad? Yes, I have one question. No, no question? Yes. Okay. Can we put him on, one, on the screen there? He's on it already, okay. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So did he say he had a question or I didn't hear that? Uh, sorry? Can you hear me? Yeah, you can hear you fine. Yeah, the room, we can hear you in the room here. Okay, uh, my question is actually, it's not clear what is the end goal of uh, uh, your uh, uh, whole patch set. Because currently you just, uh, you still keep the RTNR log, but your end goal is to remove the RTNR log from the update path. So if if you totally go to, let's say, lockless, or you, you, introduce, you, you just break down the RTNR log to some other log, so that's com completely different. So I wonder what is the end goal of this? The end goal is to speed up the... He's asking you what your end goal eventually is, just to remove the RTNR log or... To, to allow parallel execution of TC subsystem. So current bot, most prominent bottleneck is uh, RTNL lock, of course. But as soon as we remove it and we see some other obvious, obvious uh, bottlenecks, we will work on them as well. So yeah, end result is to be able to go to our driver in parallel, mm -hmm. which means removing this lock from CLS API, action API, and uh, flower, and uh, all actions. Yeah, okay. If you remember, I think we presented the last net that, that the performance of TC was around less than 100 or around 100 uh, 100 K per second. K per second yeah. And we understand that is not enough. So that's, we try to speed it out, speed it out, up. And remember that you have many ports. We're talking about a, speed, uh, a switch there. So you have like 30, 64 vac, a virtual function. So not all of them adding rules to the same uh, entity all the time to the same thing. Even that's all of them adding five tuple, you do have 64 virtual functions. There are, there are, each of them is a different net dev. So it's not the same table all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason we can, we can scale now uh, for higher performance. 
for so, so the end goal is to speed up the access to eventually update the hardware rules and the RTNL lock is just on the way and you have to remove it now. Yes. Did that satisfy you, Akon? Uh, yes, but it is, what kind of the lock will you introduce after the RTNL lock is still not clear? Let's say if you put the lock, a spin lock or some whatever lock on the device level, or maybe on a future level, so that's still different. I did not understand yeah, the question. Yeah, no, he's so. saying basically, uh, could you get this without removing the RTNL lock? I think that's the summary of it. N not really, because RTNL lock, uh, it's in my presentation, it take, it's taken very early in TC stack. Can, can you show that profile again? I don't know if we can, you can show it. It's not profile, it's without RTNL lock. Uh, the profile is without RTNL lock. After the RTNL lock has been removed? Yeah. Okay. So you don't have one that... The problem before. with the profiling, RT, I think I already explained to you privately, the problem with profiling RTNL lock is that sampling ah. profiler, like perf, he only profile, it only profiles on CPU uh, tasks. So if your task is sleeping while waiting for R RTNL lock to be released, it will not show up in sampling profiling. So that's uh, the problematic part of profiling uh, sleeping locks. Yeah. You know what, because we only have like 30 mi 40 minutes left, so maybe... That we take this offline a little bit? Sure. So, because Kong has to, he's going next. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We can, Thank you. we can talk after that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Kong, uh, you, ca you can go next. You are, we, we can see you here. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, yes, we can see your slide. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, so, uh, both. Can you put it on both screens? I'm sorry. You're just on one sc of the two screens. Right. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Kong. Uh, okay. Uh, my name is Kong Wang, and uh, uh, I'm a software engineer in Twitter kernel team. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, bring the discussion about the locking in TCC hierarchy uh, today. So uh, you are very welcome to interrupt me. The only concern is I don't have enough time. So, so let's see. No, it's okay. So, we, we, uh, this is the... we can run into the break. That's okay. The next thing that comes is a break. So we can chew into the little break. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is the agenda for the discussion uh, today. So uh, first, I'm going to review the current looking in the whole TC hierarchy, the QDISC, the future, the actions. So, and uh, after that, I'm going to take a, a quick review for the uh, RCEU uh, completeness in the uh, fast pass. And after that, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the current uh, lockless security is kind of the po a potentially truly lockless security in uh, 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 TC. And, all, uh, and uh, at the last I'm going to uh, bring up the uh, TCQ uh, mapping with the uh, TCQ disk. So let's see. So uh, currently, what is the current status of the locking we use inside TC? So, uh, like uh, uh, almost uh, all the uh, networking uh, slow paths, we, we still use the RTNL lock on the TC slow paths as well for uh, queue disks, for uh, filters, and also for actions. So, there is uh, nothing surprise here. But uh, for the fast paths, actually, mostly we are already goes to the uh, RCU reader lock. So uh, probably except for the uh, uh, TC actions. So I will talk about this later. And uh, for TC, for TC, uh, for QDisk actually it's very special because for, uh, Q, for the queuing, we still have to enqueue the packets and decue the packets on the bus pass which means they are essentially still a write operation. So we 
means we still have to think the right operations. So we can't just rely on the RTU uh, read log, obviously. So that's why we still currently hold uh, some spin log on the fast path. And for this spin log, we, we always take the, the this spin log from the root Q-disk, because uh, Q-disk is like the HTTP Q-disk is classical, so it's a hierarchical, so it has multiple uh, layers. So the root here actually is we always log from the root, and it's uh, definitely a spin log. And for the, uh, that's for the uh, uh, transmission side. For the ingress side, actually, it's pretty simple, because we essentially have no queues on the uh, in our side, we only have probably one or two kind of uh, QDisks on the inner side, and they both are QDisks. So that's why we could uh, uh, achieve lossless on the fast files for the inner side. So that problem is pretty simple. So we will see. So let's first take a look at it the transmission side. On the transmission side, so there are basically two parts. So the, the first part actually is on the in queue side. That, that is, well, uh, sometimes happen, uh, um, uh, that is happened on the process context. So, and uh, for that part, actually, we always take the root spin log, as I mentioned, when we, uh, uh, find the spin log. Uh, we will find the QDisk, and we always acquire the RCU read log inside the dev queue XMIN. So, for that part, we are protected both by the RCU read log and also by the uh, root spin log. So, when we in queue the uh, package, we already got, got both Logs and uh, once we enqueue the packet into the the QDisk, we will go to the filter uh, layer to classify this packet. So th this part is also uh, RCU uh, part of the RCU read log, and it's, it's already complete. So there's are no probably no doubt here. And after we go to go uh, over the classification, we probably need to. Uh, go to the uh, TC action uh, layer. So uh, that part we still re mostly rely on the RCU read log, uh, but I mostly that this part is not complete. So I will talk about this later. So for, uh, for now, we can just assume everything on the fast path is protected by the RCU read log and the, the root spin log. So the other part actually is the DQ part. So this part actually sometimes happens in the process context. So which means it will uh, be serialized with the in in part, or it, it could be go uh, parallel with the in if it happens in the bottom bottom half. So, but fortunately, this, this part is still protected by the uh, root spin log. And of course, after it goes, uh, we dequeue a packet, it goes to down to the driver layer. And when we hit the driver layer, it mostly depends on the driver. It might require some uh, TSQ lock or something, which is out of the our discussion here. So this this is the fast path for the transmission side. So let's let's take a look at the, how the fast path is synchronized with the slow path. So when we update some uh, queries or a filter or a t -t action, so how the slow path is synchronized with the fast path. So the most important uh, thing actually is the QDisk. The QDisk is uh, uh, very weird currently because <laughs> partly how for historical reasons is uh, it relies on some uh, uh, QDisk sleeping 
counter update because, because for the QDisk layer, actually, when we update the QDisk, we actually uh, install a new QDisk for the QDisk sleeping. But uh, it, it doesn't affect the one we use for the fast pass, which is non sleeping. So after the, uh, we install that QDisk for the sleeping, we will do a flip on the whole device level to swap the pointer to make the new, disk, new QDisk installed on the fast pass as well. So because of this flip, actually we have a chance to synchronize with the fast pass A the whole device is flipped, so that literally means the, the active QDisk is also deactivated. And also for the ingress side, actually is synchronized by the synchronized NAS API. So this is very different. Because if we compare this with the future of the action, actually they are perfectly uh, 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 pro protected by, with the traditional R RCU lock because we rely on the uh, synchronized RCU or just a core RCU callback to synchronize with the fast pass. The, the QDisk layer is completely different, so that, that's why I want to uh, highlight this part because I, I think we can possibly remove, totally remove the QDisk sleeping and switch to the uh, RCU API like the rest of the uh, uh, TC card, the filters action. So let's see a summary of this. I, I get this chart just to get a quick summary here. So for the, for the, as you can see, the, the QDisk slow pass is very weird. It's, it always sounds a, a different pointer and rely on the device flip to sync with the fast pass. And for the future and action layer, actually, they, they are pretty normal, like the rest of the uh, RCU users, we think either with uh, synchronized RCU or in this case it actually is uh, RCU callback. And the fourth, uh, the other action, uh, exception actually is uh, the standalone TC action, the shared TC action. They are different because we don't retrieve the action from the uh, you know, from the device or the filters on the device. We actually retrieve the action from some per net, net namespace data structure. So that, that is currently still protected by the RTNR lock. So, but, so if we take, if they are still single synchronized with the traditional RCU API, so there's still nothing in surprise here. So if we go back to the ingress side, actually it's pretty simple. So because this is, this is a traditional way how we uh, uh, get a package from the device to the uh, uh, networking stack. Probably there are some difference when when the device use the NAPI API, but let's Keep the traditional one. The the packet is retrieved the, uh, from the uh, from the device driver and will be put into some uh, per CPU queue, which is some input packet queue. And uh, after that, it will uh, uh, retrieved by the um, net RX action in the bottom half. From from that, actually, it will start. Entering the uh, whole TC, the networking stack and uh, uh, immediately at the entrance, actually, it will hit the ingress queue list. But uh, again, we, we don't have any queue here. So the call pass will just like, go straight forward uh, up to the uh, 
application layer. So there is no queue, there is no de decode here. So it's very simple. So is there is no, no lock, literally. So let's come back to the uh, RCU part. Let's get a review to see how, how much we can go with the uh, RCU completeness. So the, the QDSK is definitely a very uh, exceptional because essentially it has to use a spin lock because it's a, as I said, it's a right operation. At least even if we just consider it's a FIFO case, it's, it still needs to include the package into a queue, right? So this part is very hard unless we, we decide to go to some lockless queue algorithm. I will talk about this later. For the future layer, actually, we are very good. Uh, it's already uh, RCU completed. I have no, uh, no doubt on, on the future layer. For the action layer, actually, I have to repeat that actually the copy is missing. So currently, we, without this copy, actually, when we update the uh, TC action, actually the reader could, could read some inconsistent updates if we, the reader goes parallel with the writer. So this is not good. So far, there is no bug report, but, but uh, probably because this risk is uh, very hard to hit, not because it doesn't exist. So, this, as, as obviously, RCU has three parts. <laughs> Read, copy, update. The copy is very important, and it's missing. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so Cole, uh, uh, in the yeah. quick question. So, I, I didn't quite follow sure. the copy b missing there. I, I know you, you tried to explain, but I, I wasn't wasn't clear. Like, w what level okay. of copy from the RCU copy? Copying what? Uh, uh, copy is uh, copy means actually when we uh, update the 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 shared data structure, we need to make a copy according to the RCU rule. And then use that copy to replace the existing yeah, shared yeah. one. Yeah. But if, if the copy is missing, that means the update is updating the shared one, which means the reader is could still see a partial update. Okay. And do you see this as being generic, like at ACT API level or per, per, per uh, Yeah, it's, it's generic, yes. Okay. All right. Yes, and it's very important because for some uh, partial update, it could be very problematic. So it depends on the implementation. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the end of actually is obviously we need to make the RCU API consistent. So for the TC actions, so that means the, the speed log could uh, be totally gone because we rely on the uh, ITR log to think for the slow pass. So there is no point for the spin log to exist for TCA exchange. So, yeah. So, uh, as you probably noticed, there is already uh, uh, a Lot of security services, you know, the people fast, but actually is not. Actually, that's not true. It's not logless. There is there is still some lock. It's just a ring buffer. I think it's just for advertising purpose. It's it's very confusing. It's a ring buffer, and this ring buffer is not logless. There are locks. The lock. There are. Two logs actually. So there is a one consumer log and one pro, uh, producer log. The, comp the consumer log protects concurrent con consumers, and the, the producer log protects the concurrent producers. So we still have log. Fortunately, the tree, the tree spin, spin log in the uh, QBIS layer is, is uh, bypassed. That, that's true. But we can't claim it's logless. 
And uh, the good part for the for this move actually is decouples the the in queue from the D queue. This is very good. This is a, a good move. And uh, most importantly, I have to point out is it's uh, uh, PFP first. It's one of the simplest Q disk. And it's almost certainly uh, very hard to uh, uh, to uh, move the lockless idea to other complex QDs because other QDs a they they probably are not uh, uh, classless. They they probably is a hierarchy. So when we goes over a hierarchy, that's very hard to make it. Lockless. I don't need this to say they could have filters, they could have uh, actions, so it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or if it's hardware offloaded so as really well. Easy. If it's hardware offloaded, it's probably, yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> may work as well. Yeah. And uh, if, if we really look into the, the, the details of the uh, the uh, in queue and uh, DQ decouple side. So what what uh, what data structure we still share uh, with uh, in queue and DQ? So the, this uh, diagram actually shows a we we share the Q disk itself because the Q disk is global. So Every CPU possibly contains all the same QD disks. So, and uh, needless to say, there are packets dating in, in the QDs. So, the packets themselves are also shared by different CPUs. So, these are, these, these are the data structures we need to protect. And fortunately, for for single CPU, actually, we don't need to worry uh, about the 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 contention because uh, for for given CPU, we could either in the process context or on in the bottom half context. So they they don't they don't contend. and uh, yeah and. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately, sometimes actually the the in queue and the DQ uh, both are happening on in the uh, process context. So this 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 diagram is not very accurate, but just so show the worst case. Actually, I think it is possible to go logless for the for a feeble case because it's the simplest one. But uh, again, I want to point out is essentially it's very hard because we still need to sync the in queue with the DQ. And uh, also, uh, a complex queue disk could be classical and uh, hierarchical. So if you need to think about other cases, probably you need to think about how we. Uh, uh, implement a uh, tree structure loglessly, which is essentially very hard. And of course, it doesn't need to be a uh, uh, tree structure, it could be a multiple queue structure, depending on the implementation. So it's still very difficult to think with multiple queues. For the uh, FIPO case, actually, yeah, I do have some idea because you, as you probably realize, there is a, uh, already a log list, link list in the kernel uh, uh, code base. For the iPhone, that's what, that one is, uh, the order is, is completely different. That is the last three first draft. It's a single link list. So everything, every operation is happening on the head. So that means it's largely in first out, but we want firstly first out, for, at least for discussion. And also we want to uh, limit the queue size. Definitely we don't want to go to, uh, we don't want the, the, the queue size to go to infinity. 
Right. Also, because of the implementation, the, the locking is still required if we, unless we choose, choose the best operation on, on the uh, produce and uh, consumer side. But currently, we for the TCQ disk in queue and the DQ actually is not bad. We each time we in queue one single packet and each time we DQ one single packet. So actually, I I think it, it is possible to bash at least for the in queue side because the uh, dev queue XMIT is already the there are there could be multiple queues. Uh, from the stack. So I think it's possibly to best multiple packets to, to put them into the queue. But uh, probably it's very unlikely to, to do the same for the DQ. But I'm not sure. I, I'm quite open for discussing here. So if, if anyone is interested, probably you want to take a look at the the log list, li uh, list API and think about the batch, how, how, how could we batch the in queue and DQ operation. So there, there are also some other ideas, maybe it's crazy <laughs> from me, but I want to uh, give, you, give you some uh, possible ideas for discussion. So as I mentioned, the QDisk sleeping is uh, very possibly can go away. It, it has no reason to exist because uh, we have RCU and it, it is very possible we just move to the RCU without flipping the device because flipping the device is very expensive. So we just want to update one single QD so we don't want to flip the whole device. There is no point. And uh, possibly as the, someone is working on this area. It's possible, very possible to break down the, actually the global, global big lock down to some, uh, a small scope locking like a per device locking is very possible. The only reason we have RTNR lock is Probably we sometimes we need to call into the other subsystem, or we need to use some other shared data structure with other subsystems. That's the only reason for the RTR to to exist for for GC. Except that I don't see a reason. So fundamentally, it's very possible to move, uh, break it down. And also for the uh, trace bin lock in the uh, QDisk hierarchy, it is also very possible to move it down to each layer of the QDisk or at least down to each implementation because not all the QDisks have, has a hierarchy. It's the, the, the decision should be made by each implementation. So, and uh, if we, let's say, brief down the uh, trace bin log to each implementation, and each implementation will have the freedom to decide whether to move this spin lock down to each layer. Like the HTTP could go decide to move the, this spin lock to each layer on its, in so, the hierarchy. Uh, but, uh, but this is, yeah. Yeah, so Vlad, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, so, sorry, Kong, I, I, can I interject or? Yeah. Yeah, so the... Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, the per device locking is kind of interesting uh, because basically, but is this going to help in your case? Like with, uh, I'm, I'm asking Vlad actually, I don't, is there a mic? Where is the mic? Somebody have. Oh. Yeah, uh, for the case of dumping or inserting millions of rules per second, what is your view on what Kong is saying? Uh, sure, breaking down RTNL lock to per device locking will help, but removing it completely is even better. So you want to totally remove it 
as opposed, and that is useful for not to the QDisk level, but at the filter level at least. Yeah. Because the problem with per device locking is uh, it's uh, nice. That's the whole thing that is possible. Say, say that again, Kong. So even if we completely goes goes to RCU on the slow path, the right operation side, they still have to think by some long. So you think it's 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 impossible to totally remove it? Right. Yes. Uh, sure. It's impossible. Of course, it, it has to be some uh, lock which uh, controls the device and directly provides locking for attach and detaching Q disk, but uh, specifically for a rules update case, I think it's uh, possible to completely eliminate it from update pass. Uh, how, how do you protect multiple updates on the same rule? Well, I would update same rule? Yeah, you have two threads updating the same yes. rule for the same attributes, let's say. Let's say you yeah, but if you have fine-grained locking, of course, uh, you can uh, lock it on TP level. But I mean, we don't want to have a top-level lock which completely locks whole subsystem or a whole device. Right, so that, that could, uh, yeah, that's almost one of the suggestions from Kong was you, you do a more finer-grained locking at the implementation level. So, so you you think you agree there is a need for a TP, at least locking at the TP level? So or basically, how Flower currently implemented is that even if you're updating a rule, it actually deletes the old one and creates a new one. It does not really update like actions do. But you could send uh, two rules, let's say, to update two attributes of the same action, or the same attribute for, with different values. Yeah, but currently Flower it. It just deletes the old one and creates a new one. It doesn't do this RCU or any small it, what, what does it do? Like uh, is it a compact ex exchange or? It, it just deletes the old one and creates another one internally. Uh, yeah. Uh, currently, no, because we, we have some uh, API to modify the existing one without deleting. Yeah, I know, but internally it deletes the old one and creates another one. That's how it's implemented in case of flower classifiers. Because I know that for actions, you update the fields, and sometimes it's RCU, sometimes it's not, but yeah, you update the existing one. But it's not the case with flower. Uh, I essentially know, because if you think about the RCU update on the uh, right side, and it, it, we call it copy. It, it essentially uh, remove the old one and update with the new one, but it still requires a uh, right some, uh, some block here. You you can't get 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 removed on this side. But the Part device locking will be less fine grained than part TP locking. Yeah, right? because it depends on on your work set, right? Because if you really need to update a bunch of rules on single device, you are locked uh, anyway. It's on, only good if you know that uh, your uh, rules are spread out like evenly between all devices on switch, for example. Yeah, yeah. Kong, can I? Are you going to pay more attention to Vlad's patches when he posts when he's posting there? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. To yeah. Give him some good feedback. I didn't have time to look at, look at the, the, the code yet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, why don't you continue? Because uh, we are we don't have as much time, and then we can come back to some more questions. Is this the last uh, slide? I think I almost done. Okay. Uh, almost probably there's one. one. Yeah. Uh, the dev queue disk sleeping. Um, oh, that that's an interesting one. That that shouldn't be. What does that buy you? It's just because when you're adding a new key disk, it, and it, it, it will improve the latency of uh, up doing the create? Uh, I don't know, because I asked David, he actually doesn't know either. I, I, I guess the, the reason for the 
uh, Curtis sleeping actually is uh, previously we we didn't have RCU, so th that means we have to bring down the fast pass in order to sync with the slow pass. But with RCU, actually, this is not necessary. Yeah. That's that's my understanding. Yeah, I think you're right. There was no RCU at the time, and. Uh, is it QDisk sleeping that gets in inserted when the device goes down, or is that the no op? There's one that gets replaced when the device goes administratively down. When you have config down. Uh, yes, it will, uh, it will install some no QDisk. Okay, when no, you when, when, when we remove, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I have to look at the code. I don't remember, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Are there any questions for Kong? Well, okay. Any more comments from your side? Kong? Uh, yeah, because there, uh, there's still the last part I, I didn't finish is uh, the TXQ mapping with the QDisk because this is also relevant to the logging. Because if we could map the TXQ with the QDisk one to one like the MQ QDisk, Essentially, the, the, the connection is oh, let's say, is TRQ mapped with is CPU, so, so, yeah, I just want to, that's why I want to bring up the uh, uh, TSQ mapping here. Okay. I think there's some good ideas in there. You're, you're thinking about you just uh, thinking about it right now. Or you have you started working on some patches. Uh, I'm still thinking about the the ideas, but uh, I, yeah. Okay. Except the RCU part, actually, I, I didn't work on anything yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, Vlad is doing some good stuff there. It's uh, feedback. David just applied some of his patches. You said you had 60? <laughs> so five more patches. Five more? Uh, 14, I thought, just went in. Five more patch sets, not patch Oh, patch sets, okay. Okay, well, thanks, Kong. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a hundred applause. Okay. All right, that uh, is it. We're almost like on time by five minutes. Well, we went past five minutes. But. So it's a break, and next session is yeah the open uh, Linux Net OS for Switch ASICs at in 12 minutes. No, sorry, in eight minutes. I'm sorry we ate into that break. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>